Professor, in New York, no deaths. I believe that occurred yesterday. We had zero deaths for the first time in 100 plus uh, days. Does that mean we can let our guard down? Does that mean we can dash off to the restaurants for lunch today? Well, certainly it does not mean that. Um, but I do think what it does say is that we are not inevitably stuck with the uh, you know tremendous spread of the virus. It's up to us. You know, New Yorkers uh, hunkered down for quite a while. Um, people have been very uh, worried, and so they've stayed um, vigilant in New York, and that has allowed the cases to come down. That path is available to every other part of the country if they choose to take it. And, of course, like you said, once they take it, you really need to stick with it until we get a vaccine. Many countries around the world have been able to do that successfully. Professor, would you eat in a restaurant indoors right now? Um, I would say uh, probably not, I think. I think I, I, I would, though, consider uh, outdoor seating. Um, in fact, I did do that once, So, uh, but I have not eaten indoors. So how do we, and so what I'm really fascinated by at the moment, clearly the sun belt's pretty hot down there at the moment. People are going inside for the AC. That does seem to be a significant source of transmission. In the northeast in the United States and here in Europe, I, at the moment it's summer, we can all go and sit outside, nice to eat al fresco. But come October, November, December, how are we going to transfer that inside? How do we make that happen or do you think it will be impossible? Well, I think it's very important for employers that can keep people at home to keep people at home. We have to thin out the workplace as much as possible. Um, I think we're going to have to be very vigilant. Hopefully we can build up a more intense public health response. I don't necessarily think that indoor restaurants are... Um, you know, bad for everybody. If you keep the numbers low and you separate people, the risk is pretty low. Uh, maybe it's a little high for me, but it's still pretty low. Um, and it also depends on how much is out there in the community. So I think you have to kind of take it one step at a time. But if we have more of a public health response and we can, we're vigilant, we can do testing well, then, you know, you can manage that. There are places around the world that are opening restaurants again because they've been able to have a strong response. You talk about testing, you talk about managing the virus. Do we have a handle on what the level of uh, asymptomatic instance of the virus is? And does that number go higher as we get into a younger demographic? I think generally speaking, it appears that at least about half of the infections, people don't develop symptoms. Um, and it does appear to be more likely, I think, when they're younger people who are getting sick. So, you know, that has obviously made things complicated. It doesn't prevent you, though, from having a strong public health response because if you track the cases and their contacts, you can get to people who may never develop symptoms, but you can keep them from going out by asking them to stay at home. Um, and so there are ways to reduce the spread, even if there are people who won't get symptoms. And that's why this approach has worked in other countries. It's just um, an extra reason, though, for people to, to wear masks um, and to uh, take all kinds of precautions. Joshua Sharstein there of John Hopkins University, and I mentioned this an hour ago on our simulcast on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television, Peter Hotez of Baylor University with a blistering tweet this morning, a three-part tweet, speaking of the president and science. And it was really quite mm -hmm. something to see this going on after the last number of days. We value the efforts here. Stephen, Stephen Riley of Imperial College, Paul Sweeney, with us earlier this morning, who's arguably the best guy on yeah. urban to rural transfer in virology. Uh, tell me about the urban to rural transfer of growthiness <laughs> in this market. I mean, Paul, come on. It's, you know, it, it's yeah, I know it's this thing we've been talking about, talking about the lack of breath in this market. I mean, if you own those five, six, okay, seven names, you're literally just sitting on the beach, no, you know, Paul, Paul, collecting, uh, Paul, you know, counting Paul, your beans. But if you're anybody else, what do you do? Paul, Bassinet at Citigroup takes Amazon to 3550. <laughs> Does somebody start screaming at Cowan and say, Blackledge, you slacker, exactly. get out in front of him. And yeah, he goes the pressure up to 3700. The pressure on these guys is, is crazy. Oh. The clients are from their bosses, too. I have the company for the triple leveraged all cash fund <laughs> futures advance up 23 stay with us paul sweeney and tom king this is bloomberg radio 
I've always wanted to learn another language, but every time I try, it never sticks. So I decided to give Babbel a try, and I really like the teaching method of the app. I started with the beginner lesson on Babbel, and it starts with simple words and phrases, and soon you're putting those words into a conversation. Each lesson takes about 10 to 15 minutes, and they're all really different, which keeps things interesting. The app is really smart. It actually keeps track of the words I'm struggling with so I can practice them and get better. I chose Babbel because it was created by real language teachers. They built it around real life, how people actually communicate, and what they care about. I can't wait to use my new language skills in the real world. Dos cervezas, por favor. <laughs> with Babbel, get conversational in Spanish, French, German, and more. It just takes 10 to 15 minutes a day. Now try Babbel free. Just go to Babbel.com and start learning a new language today. That's Babbel.com. B-A-B-B-E-L.com. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, makes innovation happen. The university helped biomedical engineering professor Tara Alvarez launch a startup that may revolutionize vision therapy. Our startup through NJIT is called Ocular Motor Technology. We create virtual reality vision therapy in a head-mounted display. So it's gaming and basically sugarcoating the therapy so that children and young adolescents don't even realize they're doing therapy. To accomplish this, we need biomedical engineers, which are here on NJIT campus, computer scientists, artists, people that are into story development, and then we are collaborating with a lot of the large pediatric medical centers. This idea of a startup culture is extremely important to not just NJIT and the National Science Foundation, but also to the U.S. as a societal whole. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. Millions of people in the UK struggle to put food on the table. That's why Asda's donated £23 million to Fair Share and the Trussell Trust since 2018. Please help us do more by donating to our Fight Hunger Trolleys in store. Asda, we're all in this together. Fair Share and the Trussell Trust of registered charities. See asda.com forward slash fight hunger. Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Monday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. When you're facing a problem, like how to make an electric car more efficient, you could sit down and talk it through. But at Honda, we decided to listen to the wind tunnel. With wing mirrors? No. Or without? Yes. With? No. Without? Yes. With? No. Without? Yes. Or with cameras instead of wing mirrors? A new Honda E with wind cameras, not mirrors, because we listen to the wind. Honda, the power of dreams. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, I'm Karen Moscow, along with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. And the opening bell brought to you by SEI, Crisis Emphasized Character and Partnership, One Mission, One Community, SEI. Go to SEIC.com slash IMS. And stocks are higher at the open. The S&P 500 up 8 tenths percent or 24 points at 3210. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 9 tenths percent or 230 points at 26,308. And the Nasdaq up 1.1 percent or 111 points at 10,729. Ten-year Treasury down 330 seconds yield 0.65 percent. The yield on the two-year 0.15 percent. NYMEX crude oil is down 4 tenths percent or 17 cents at $40.39 a barrel. And COMEX gold is up 
up nine tenths percent or fifteen dollars seventy cents at eighteen seventeen eighty an ounce. The euro one point one three four four against the dollar. The yen one oh seven point two three. Tom and Paul. Uh, Karen, thanks so much. We'll continue to watch the markets. Clearly, the opening oomph is greater than what we saw uh, with the futures activity uh, earlier. What we've been trying to do is speak to experts, not pundits, not people uh, speaking with not a lot of authority. And what you do when you want to talk vaccines, you talk to a physics major. Uh, we do that now. Matthew Harrison joins from Morgan Stanley. Uh, he's got parchment from Yale in physics, and that has prepared him for the physics of biotechnology and of vaccines as well. Matthew, on a given weekend, when you're not surrounded by institutional investors hanging on your every buy, hold, and sell, and someone waxes philosophical about vaccines, what's the number one thing the public gets wrong right now about the search for a silver bullet? I think the biggest thing that I hear is concerns around mutations and um, the time that it takes to, to make a vaccine. I think there are two different things that are happening right now. One is that the key part um, of the virus that we're trying to go after, the spike protein to create a vaccine, has been relatively genetically stable. We have not seen any significant mutations there yet. And so that gives me um, you know, a positive view on the potential to make a vaccine. And then the second thing is, while the timelines here are dramatically faster than um, what we've experienced in the past, the flip side is rarely have we done so many items in parallel as we're doing now. So, for example, just with manufacturing, you would never invest the amount of money um, to make supply of vaccine available after phase one studies. You would wait until you had significant data from phase two. And so here that, that was done almost coincident with putting vaccines into the clinic. So um, the ability to speed up lots of processes that take a lot longer um, without impacting potential yeah. safety is, is different in this regard. How will the big, and folks, I have to explain that Matthew Harrison, maybe more than anyone on the street, is best adjusted to the sexiness of biotechnology and all that with the big pharmas as well, because he's followed them both. How do the big pharmas play with the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit of biotechnology. Every year is different. What's forward the next five years? I think you're seeing more partnerships. I think pharmaceutical companies have realized that they can tap into the entrepreneurship of, of biotech companies by helping them with the biggest issue that small companies have, which is money and fundraising and they can um but then they can allow them to push forward their projects without a lot of interference but still have long-term economics on the project so i think you're seeing a new kind of collaboration where large companies offer money but then a, a more hands-off approach until the projects get to a much later stage of development so, Matthew, as we think about this COVID vaccine, in air quotes, I guess, is this going to be, I know there's so many biotech and pharma companies going down the path. There's, you know, I, you know, I saw a chart recently about, you know, almost a dozen partnerships or separate companies. Is this going to end up being something like the HIV in a sense that it's a cocktail of different vaccines and or treatments here? Um, I, I think definitely on the therapeutic side, you're starting to see the need to combine different kinds of therapies together. On the vaccine side, you're unlikely to combine multiple vaccines together, but I think you will see more than one successful vaccine come to market. All right, then, of course, the question that everybody asks, I know you probably get asked this a lot as well, is timing. Timing for, I'm going to say, you know, broad mass distribution. Um, what is your best guess there? Yes. So um, I think our view is that by the middle of November is our base case when we're going to have phase three data. That puts us in a position to have tens to hundreds of millions of doses available by the end of the year. So then broad distribution starts to happen sometime in the first quarter. And we've said mass vaccination of the entire population by summer of 2021. Wow, that's uh, now that would be just to help us put that in context, Matthew. That would be just infinitely faster than a typical vaccine could get the market, right? Uh, yes, the, historically, I think the fastest vaccine to market has taken about four or five years. 
Um, the difference, as wow. I said here, is that, that many of these things are being done in parallel, whereas traditionally they are done in sequence. And so that has a dramatic impact um, on the timeline. And then I guess the other thing that's, that's probably worth pointing out is in, in, a, in a typical flu season, about 40 to 50 percent of the U.S. population gets vaccinated. We need to do much better than that to reach herd immunity in the U.S. And so, uh, you know, in turn, in the timeline is even if we have yeah. a lot of doses available in the first quarter, it may take longer to vaccinate um, the entire population. You know, this has been a pandemic. We sort of steer away from this, Matthew Harrison, but I've, I've got to do this. Buy, hold, sell. Do you have a single best buy right now? In in COVID stocks, Tom, or, or broadly you know, speaking? No, broadly speaking, you know. I. Yeah, I think I think broadly speaking, we're we're most focused on Amgen right now. Um, I, I think it's 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 the only uh, large cap biotech that we're recommending right now, and um, our, our focus has been on the durability of the base business as well as they have three major catalysts coming up in the second half of the year. So, Matthew, as it relates to the economics of a COVID vaccine. How is this going to work? Are they going to be giving it away, doing it at cost? Are they going to mark it up like they would a regular drug? How's, how do you think the economics are going to play out here? It, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's one that I think we don't have as much visibility into. What, what we've said and how we've tried to model it out is we assume right now lowest cost pricing, which is essentially flu vaccines are probably the, the cheapest of the vaccines that are available. And in the U.S., they, they range from 10 to $20 um, a vaccination. And so that's, that's what we're using as, as a pricing model. Yeah. I mean, this is so important. I think it came up twice this weekend, uh, Matthew. I, I mean, I can't imagine there's any other answer, but, you know, a la polio in the 1950s, early 60s, the miracle of that vaccination program, or even smallpox uh, hundreds of years ago, decades ago, I should say, or a century ago, are we going to force people to take the vaccine? Is it going to be optional? Tom, it's a, it's a good question. That one I don't think I have a great answer yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think that will be left for policymakers and, and government. But, you know, from a scientific standpoint, the more people we can vaccinate, the better we can protect the population at large from the virus. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think you, we see it today, um, uh, just kind of the politicization of that. So, Matthew, again, as it relates to some of these COVID issues, um, are there other ways for investors to maybe get some exposure to what might be treatments here? So, yeah, I mean, broadly, the, the other emerging treatment that people are focused on are these antibody cocktails where essentially you're trying to make a synthetic version of the antibodies that patients who have recovered from the virus have to, to potentially protect themselves from the virus. And so there are a handful of companies um, that are working on, on those treatments, and we would expect sometime in August to, to figure out if they work or not. Matthew Harrison, it's been wonderful. Greatly appreciate the time. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Mr. Harrison is with Morgan Stanley here on Biotech and on the vaccine. Paul, I just think it, it's thunderous to me, given the nonstop pandocracy of this, to speak to people who are just shockingly deeply ingrained in virology and microbiology. Yeah. And I was, you know, I, you know, I just was taking a look at Matthew Harrison's report from Morgan Stanley. Um, and again, uh, pretty aggressive timeline there. Um, and it's he's not alone. There are some others out there yes. who think that uh, all the work that's being done will have uh, some fruits uh, maybe later this year and then uh, in scale uh, the first well, half of next year, and, and that certainly would be uh, good news. And a belief in the market, and again, you see it again on this Monday. Yep. We're up 23 points on SPX as well. Dow up 186 points with the news. In New York City, here's Michael Barr. Tom Paul, thank you very much. At least 33 states are seeing higher rates of new cases of coronavirus compared to the previous week. Democratic Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms responded to Republican Governor of Georgia Brian Kemp being opposed to the mask mandate she issued for her city. And only he can speak to his motives. But I think that it's unfortunate that when we know that the science says that wearing a mask is one of the easiest ways to stop the spread, uh, that we have the leader of our state taking exception with it. 
Florida reported more than 15,000 new COVID-19 cases, the highest number of new cases in a single day by any state since the coronavirus pandemic began. Republican Miami Mayor Francis Suarez explained the possibility of implementing stay-at-home orders again for his city. We definitely saw a, a significant uh, you know, flattening of the curve when we implemented a stay-at-home order in March, April. And uh, you know, if we get to a point where we don't feel that uh, we can care for the people that are getting sick, that's something that we're going to have to strongly look at. The Washington Redskins say they will be retiring the Redskins name and logo upon completion of a review. According to a statement this morning, the NFL team is now working to develop a new name and design approach. Actress Kelly Preston has died. Her husband, John Travolta, says Preston lost her two-year battle with breast cancer. Kelly Preston was 57. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom Paul. Hello, Michael Barr. Thanks so much, Paul. You know, I think, I think Tesla's just a flash in the pan. <laughs> yeah. Over $1,700 a share today. Just looking at the chart here, it's just uh, you know, no matter what time frame you look at, it's just an incredible, incredible it's a, story. It's, it's a momentum stock like yeah. I'm not sure we've seen in, well, certainly in my 30-year career. 393% is my calculation off the uh, March spike down. Yeah. The gloom of March. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, up 600% on a trailing 12-month basis there so i mean just and obviously an all time high today so for those folks i mean do you really want to go there on a monthly chart (laughs) i'm I'm eyeballing it folks the bloomberg doesn't move that quick good morning mr bloomberg i think we're (laughs) out six standard deviations yeah this is just a monthly chart yeah, yeah. So I don't, you know, it's it, it's interesting here. The bulls here, obviously, they're just looking at that, you know, that huge addressable market that could develop on a global basis, you know, over the next <laughs> decade. And that's kind of what drives well, this story for those that are drinking the Kool-Aid. I mean, I don't even understand this, but there's a thing called SI slash percent of float. Yeah. Paul, the short interest is shown on the DES screen is 9.47%. <laughs> They've just gotten crushed, and as Elon Musk said, he would do to them, and he said that you don't want to be short this name, and uh, he was certainly correct no. yet again. I, 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 should, I should have bought it when Mr. <laughs> Winkler said so. Good morning to our former editor-in-chief, guy that And proud me. Tesla owner, he driver. He whispered in my ear when he hired me, buy Tesla. <laughs> right. So oh, we'll see. unbelievable. Anyway, just 1746 yep. per share for Tesla. The market up as well, up 205 points. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Pursuits look at luxury. Top art galleries and famous artists like Jeff Koons received millions in U.S. bailout loans. Gagosian, David Zwerner, Pace, and Hauser and Worth were among the largest recipients of Paycheck Protection Program aid to more than 3,000 entities listed in the art dealers category, with each getting aid in the range of $1 to $5 million. Meanwhile, many of the smallest galleries were left out, highlighting inequalities within the art world that mirrored the disparities in getting federal aid across the rest of the country. The pandemic has been a boon to Swiss running shoemaker on AG, whose proprietary cushioning technology has attracted Roger Federer as an investor and runners to its wares. On AG's online sales, more than tripled in the three months through May as consumers itching for a good workout but wary of gyms turn to outdoor running as the best way to stay in shape during the pandemic. Visit BloombergPursuits.com for more. I'm Andrew O'Day, Bloomberg Radio. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. I came out in the 11th grade. Nobody was embracing you. The kids were cruel. It was very difficult to be gay. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. The hard part was determining that I was going to do it, but I definitely didn't do it alone. At age 30, with the help of her mentor, Carissa finished her high school diploma. I have a mentor, Maria. She convinced me to continue my education and finish what I started to get my diploma. She just never judges. She's a true role model. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, go get it. You can do it. No one gets a diploma alone. 
If you are thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Global News. Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Monday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. Thanks to National Lottery Players, the Emerald Centre are now providing emergency food supplies and support for people in Bedfordshire like Alan. Thank you. And £600 million of National Lottery funding is on its way to thousands more local projects in England and across the UK during these exceptional times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The National Lottery. Your numbers make amazing happen. You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow, and stocks are rising as investors brace for earnings that will offer a window into the health of the world's biggest economy amid a raging pandemic. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P 500 is up six-tenths percent, or 19 points, at 3,204. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up about seven-tenths percent, or 180 points, to 26,257. And the Nasdaq up one and a quarter percent, or 129 points, to 10,747. Ten-year Treasury down 332. Yield 0.65 percent. They yield on the two-year 0.15 percent. Nymex crude oil is down one percent or 41 cents at forty dollars fourteen cents a barrel. Comex gold is up six tenths percent or eleven dollars thirty cents at eighteen twelve seventy an ounce. The euro one point one three four eight against the dollar. The yen one zero seven point two eight. Watching PepsiCo up seven tenths percent this morning. And this is after the snack maker reported stronger than expected second quarter sales. And we continue to watch Maxim Integrated Products. It is up almost. 13 percent and analog devices is down 2.7 percent analog devices agreeing to acquire maxim and that's a bloomberg business flash tom and paul karen thanks so much paul sweeney and tom Keane on a monday starting a week off here paul sweeney and i with a major shout out as we do a phased in return to our world headquarters at queen victoria street in london and it's 731 Lexington Avenue here on Lexington at 59th Street in New York. I was talking to uh, the guy that puts all this together for us for Bloomberg Surveillance. And Paul Roman, Roman just said to me, the complexities of dealing with security and yep. air systems. And, you know, a prima donna like me walks in and just thinks things happen, like the coffee's there at 4 a.m. <laughs> but it's incredibly, it's been a real window, Paul, for me into how... We're going to reopen service sector America. It's not routine, is it? It's not routine, Tom. And, I'm, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, you guys are on the front lines there. It's surveillance kind of phasing in, I guess we'll call it a phasing in. And I think that's what a lot of businesses are Everybody's doing about. it. Yeah. yeah, everybody's doing it. You have to figure it out. And you can do it in phases and waves. And who knows when we'll yeah. be back to full strength. But it's good to, yeah. to hear that you guys are back in the We're street. on, like, phase three or phase 23. <laughs> I don't know. One of them. Right now, in, in, you know, it's, it's great to work with the people we work with. And I really want to thank Guy Johnson over in London for pointing this out to me this morning, it's a, the moonshot of Dr. Copper, which went straight down and has come straight back, and that is uh, the province of Damien Sassauer, who looks at Chile and the emerging market copper producers, is, well, uh, Damien, what is the significance for mining EM to see copper rebound back to the high range it was at before? 
Well, you definitely want to see the commodity producers bounce back. That, to me, will be evidence that, you know, what we're seeing here at EM, that, 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 there's, more, that, that, that there's more good stuff to come, that, that, that the rebound has some legs. But, I mean, this week is going to be absolutely critical, Tom. I mean, we're going to see Chile, Korea, and Indonesia, their central banks, announce this week whether or not they're going to move lower on rates. And all yeah. evidence points to the fact that they are going to stay on hold. So, for me... The post-meeting price action in currencies will be absolutely critical because markets have been rewarding central banks for stimulating, for cutting rates. If these guys go on hold, what their currencies do relative to the dollar is going to be absolutely critical in my mind. Explain to our audience, particularly those not the, the sophistication of Damien Sassar, uh, why they don't want to lower rates. That does, that's counterintuitive. Right. So, I mean, obviously you would think that a higher yielding economy, an economy that has higher yield, higher rates, will draw in offshore investment that will lead to a higher currency, an appreciating currency, right? But now with the U.S. Uh, 10 year, I mean, basically a nominal term, basically all but disappeared, any yield advantage there. But with real yields, 10 year real yields now trading at negative 77 basis points, Tom, nearly matching the December 2012 low. I mean, you're going to be looking to places like Indonesia, Malaysia, South Africa, where real yields are hovering around 5%. I mean, those are economies that have greater potential to stimulate more and provide duration gains to offshore creditors. And so when you look at, for example, the investment-grade U.S. short-term corporate debt ETF gives you a negative real yield. I mean, it's just maddening. You know, you're going to have to get it somewhere, right? And, you know, I'm going to go Greek on you here, Tom. Data, oh, time. <laughs> Time, time is the key thing here to ah. recognize deteriorating fundamentals. So, you know, amidst all this relative talk of who's better and mm. who's worse and who's, who the winners and losers are, time is, is the uh, factor that we're going to be uh, working on oh, here. I'm waxing <laughs> theta this morning. I'm all That's theta right. with Damien Sasso. On a Monday morning, no less. Theta. So, Davey, give us a sense of kind of fun flows into emerging markets. Are, what's going on there? Are people kind of dipping their toes a little bit more? Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, the MSCI EM equity index, I think it was trading at something like a 40% valuation discount to the S&P back in, you know, end of May. And now we've, you know, we've, we've not really come back from that. So, you know, what you're seeing is, yeah, well, you know, EM has done well. The flows really aren't there. But, you know, now we're seeing the euro rally versus the dollar, and a weaker dollar solves a lot of emerging market problems, Paul. And so, you yeah. know, with all that's going on here now, especially with the election in the U.S. coming up and a Biden win, you know, I mean, that's becoming a very real possibility. I mean, that could be very, very uh, bullish for EM currencies. And so I think a lot of them Why is that? look at that. Well, simply put, right? I mean, if, if, if it's a return to fundamentals, right? If the perception amongst the markets is that Biden's going to be spending more money, that he's likely to use executive authority to push health, labor, environmental policies, which, you know, very well may happen, you know, and, and, and back away from campaign commitments on, on, on corporate taxation and higher price. I don't think that's going to happen either, personally. So, you know, you might have a change in tax policy as well. So all of these things are building up in the minds of investors and perhaps, you know, fueling that weaker dollar theme. Now, betting against the dollar has been historically a very bad thing to do if you're an emerging market practitioner such as myself. No. But, the, but the pillars that were supporting it, rate differentials, higher oil prices, U.S. asset market outperformance, certainly equities, and certainly safe haven demand for the dollar, Tom, where <clears> now when you see basically yields at zero, I mean, you know, the Fed is – Backstopping right. everything. I mean, really, do you need safe haven dollar? You know, I, so you know, all this is being thrown into doubt, and I see where the dollar bears are standing on. I just, you know, we just don't see the flows yet. Yeah, um, da yeah, da Damien. I mean, you're a big football guy. You're acclaimed for the pool. I'm, I'm looking. You know, maybe we could do like a package deal here, and we could rename the Redskins <laughs> the Washington Teslas. You know, well, I mean. You know, I I was listening to Harry Styles with the top down out in South out in Southampton over the weekend, and we were talking about <laughs> names for the Redskins, you know, and, and I got to tell you, you know, Dan Snyder's got a tough job there because he's going to make a lot of people very unhappy one way or the other. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Damien Sassar, thank you so much. Greatly appreciated to get us started on a Monday here. We should point out Mr. Sassar is a nodding acquaintance with taking uh, a few dollars doubloons from those betting on football games. He seems to pull <laughs> Always do exactly better. right. <clears throat> That'll be interesting to see what happens down in Washington, as Damien was saying. There, it's yeah. uh, there's going to be a it's a almost a, but it's it's an impossible. It's a very difficult situation to be in, but it's one Paul, uh, of Mr. Snyder's own making, arguably. Back to April, John Maggie, 1948, I believe, the technical analysis book that everybody reads cover to cover in that trade. Gaps always close. Gaps always fill. I'm counting a minimum of four gaps in Tesla. 
right. since the middle of April. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. It's just been a. I don't a think I've ever shot. seen that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, they make a couple of cars, or they they actually deliver <clears throat> some vehicles in a quarter, and that's enough for another twenty, twenty, thirty percent move. So, um, it's just a fantastic story for the Bulls. Yeah. Then the and the and the shorts just a uh, brutal time. Driving forward the conversation through the morning, Bloomberg Radio versus David Wilson with those stock reports along the way. The Dow up two hundred thirty-two points. We are produced by the Max, the masked one, Richard Truman. This is Bloomberg. Asset managers who seize change. Millions of people in the UK struggle to put food on the table. That's why Asda's donated £23 million to Fair Share and the Trussell Trust since 2018. Please help us do more by donating to our Fight Hunger trolleys in store. Asda, we're all in this together. Fair Share and the Trussell Trust of registered charities. See asda.com forward slash fight hunger. Honda. We're not a car company. We're more of a listening company. And now our ears have brought our attention to where people feel most comfortable, the lounge. So we asked ourselves, what could Honda do to innovate in this space? Well, how about more space? Calm and uncluttered with modern yet retro styling and built-in screens compatible with your games console. It's the most comfortable lounge you've ever driven. Introducing the new Honda E, our small electric city car. Honda. The power of dreams. From all of us at Thames Water, thank you for supporting our key workers. As the weather warms up, demand for our water is growing, so we need your help more than ever. From taking shorter showers to turning off your sprinklers, you can make every drop count inside and outside your home to keep taps flowing in your community. Just don't forget to keep washing your hands regularly in line with government advice. Be an H2O hero. Find out how at thameswater.co.uk forward slash watersmart. Stay close to College Hoops Conversation with the College Basketball Talk podcast from NBC Sports. Join Rob Doster and Bobby Reagan for weekly recaps of what's happening in every conference, nostalgic flashbacks to classic games, and big picture discussions on the future of the sport. Yes, they, they found a way to ensure that there was a financial incentive for being able to get paid for 4K okay, to go there, if that makes sense. But it's not, there was still a recruitment involved, right? Let, let me think about it like this. Like Search College Basketball Talk on TuneIn to listen. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. How do you keep track of all your favorite stations and podcasts? Easy. You add them to your favorites list. Just find the audio you want to bookmark and tap the heart icon. Then whenever you want to browse your favorites, you'll find everything under the favorites tab. Ready to talk brass tacks on what's happening in Major League Baseball? Turn to the Effectively Wild podcast from Fangraphs for daily statistics, analysis, and commentary. One team will say, yeah, we're going to keep paying minor leaguers their stipend, and another team will say, we're going to extend the stipend through this month, and then another team will say, nope, we're cutting them off. So are extending it at least through August, which would basically be the end of the minor league regular season. Search Effectively Wild on TuneIn to listen. Times Radio, an exciting new national speech station, is here. Featuring live news, analysis, conversation, and the unequivocal world-beating journalism of The Times. Join Asma Mir and me, Stig Abel. I'm John Pienaar. Join me on Times Radio. Join me, Mariella Frostra. I'm Giles Corrin. Hello, I'm Kathy Newman. This is Michael Portillo. Join me, Carol Walker. I'm Hugo Rifkind. Times Radio is here. Search Times Radio on TuneIn to listen. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is Bloomberg Radio. 
This is Bloomberg Markets with Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney. How do you kind of view the volatility in the marketplace here? The harshest downturn for American workers in history. Companies across the board, across industries, really trying to shore up their balance sheets. There's very, very disturbing dynamics at work. Breaking market news and insight from Bloomberg experts. There's only so much that you can speed up vaccine development. Because of all the dislocations, there's always relative value trades that you could be doing. This could be a U-shaped recession rather than a V-shaped recession. It's the uncertainty, I think, that is really spooking everyone. This is Bloomberg Markets with Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Good Monday morning from New York City and points beyond to our worldwide audience. Another Monday we are here. Hans Olson, CIO of Fiduciary Trust, he's coming up. Give us his thoughts on the market and then a fascinating discussion with Dr. Peter Bach, director of Memorial Sloan Kettering Center for Health Policy. We're going to get his thoughts on how hospitals are dealing with potential treatments for the COVID-19 virus. But first, let's go to Greg Jarrett of Bloomberg News for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Greg. We're sponsored by Witham, a forward-thinking advisory and accounting firm helping clients be in a position of strength in the new reality of business. Learn more about their innovative solutions by visiting Witham.com. Stocks jumped into the green at the open following last week's rally as earnings season kicks off and traders are waiting for reports from the largest banks on Wall Street, which could offer a sign of the strength of the economic rebound. Pepsi got things going with a strong beat for second quarter after nationwide lockdown led to a boost in revenue. Pepsi is up to seven-tenths of one percent. And we check the markets every 15 minutes with the S&P now up seven-tenths of a percent, up 22. The Dow's up eight-tenths of a percent, up 208. And the Nasdaq's up 1.2 percent, up 127. The 10 years down 430 seconds with a yield of 0.65 percent. West Texas Intermediate Crude is down uh, just over 1 percent at $40.12 a barrel. Comex Gold's up six tenths of a percent at 1813.10 per ounce. The dollar yen, 107.25. The euro, $1.1354. And the British pound, $1.2620. Citigroup has reached an agreement to provide middle office services for investment managers using BlackRock's Aladdin provider platform. The agreement expands the offerings by New York-based Citigroup, which already provides custody and several other services to some BlackRock funds and many asset managers on the Aladdin platform. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg Markets is underway with Vaughn and Paul. All right, Greg Jarrett, thank you. Well, it is another week and we are off to another green start. It is earnings starting as well this week. Let's get to Dave Wilson to tell us more. Well, you know, you look at today's trading, Bonnie. I mean, uh, you, you see uh, it, it's kind of a mixed bag to some extent, although, uh, you know, we are see, seeing the S&P 500 and other indexes moving up. You look at the 11 main industry groups, you've got six up, five down. You know, they're the consumer discretionary category kind of leading the way. Of course, that's retailers and automakers and a bunch of other stocks. Healthcare doing well, which you would expect, and especially given that Pfizer uh, got the uh, clearance from regulators here in the U.S. for what they call a fast track designation on their uh, proposed uh, COVID 19 vaccines, two of them anyway, that they're developing with a German uh, company, BioNTech. And uh, Pfizer shares up about three and a half percent. And also, you, you, you look at that particular group, healthcare, you see the medical testing companies, uh, Quest Diagnostics and Laboratory Corp of America, both up more than 4%. That's significant. They, they've actually, you know, you can see what customers are reading on the Bloomberg terminal in terms of, uh, you know, individual stocks. And that's been an area that we've really seen some interest for several weeks now. And, you know, when you see the backups at the testing centers uh, across the U.S., you can sort of understand why. Also, Perk and Elmer in that category, I mean, they came out with the preliminary figures uh, showing that their second quarter revenue rose by about 12 percent. And it's all about growing demand from these COVID-19 testing labs. So, you know, that clearly is an area that investors are focusing on at this point. So, Dave, we know this is a big earnings week. And I guess when the banks come out, um, I guess it's just a tale of how bad the loan loss reserves are. Is that going to be what investors are really focusing on here? As I mean, opposed to it's the not just the reserves. It's, you know, what they're actually experiencing in terms of, of loan losses at this point. Right. You know, what kind of shape are their customers in is really what it comes down to. And, you know, to what extent are they going to have to adjust for the fact going forward that, you know, their, their customers are hurting in a lot of cases, whether we're talking about, 
you know, consumers that don't have jobs and are trying to get by somehow or businesses that haven't been able to operate and, you know, may not be operating even as we speak at this point, at least in some cases. So, you know, that's going to be a focus and it really starts tomorrow because, you know, among the four biggest lenders, we get three of them. Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo. Bank of America, the fourth one, is due on Thursday and there are going to be a bunch of other lenders as well uh, this week. So we are going to get a fair fairly broad sense of how uh, the industry is faring in light of everything that uh, consumers and businesses have been through in light of the uh, coronavirus. So, Dave, what do we anticipate in terms of deals? Because we've got a big deal today, and it looks like things might be heating up again in that area. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you get this uh, Maxim Integrated Products uh, chip maker up more than 13%. Uh, after agreeing with takeover by analog devices, uh, and that stock, by the way, down about 3%. So, you know, that's one piece of the puzzle. The other piece is what's going on with SPACs, Special uh, Purpose Acquisition wait. Company, blank yes. check companies. Basically, you know, you put your money behind somebody and figure they're going to be able to make a deal. You got two of those going on today. And you're talking about a couple of the most active stocks in early trading. Uh, one of them I- involving the electric car developer Fisker. And this had come up last week. Uh, Spartan Energy Acquisition is, is merging with them. You're talking about a $2.9 billion deal and a much bigger one involving another SPAC, uh, Churchill Capital III. Uh, and these names don't matter. What matters, in essence, is the company that's going public by combining with them. And in this case, we're talking about Multiplan, which does health care cost management. And you're talking about an $11 billion deal there. So, you know, we'll see if it's sort of a one-day wonder with these SPACs no, or whether not, there's a whole lot more going on. Dave, it's actually, it seems to be becoming a thing now. We're expecting another massive one later this week with Bill Ackman's Pershing Square Tontine SPAC. So why are SPACs suddenly so popular? Well, I mean, it, it's kind of been on and off over the years, but, you know, I mean, with the rebound we've seen in stocks, at the very least, you know, there there's some reason to put your money behind these sponsors, whether we're talking about Bill Ackman or maybe uh, more obscure names, uh, those that are known in the investment community, uh, and, and figure they're going to be able to come up with transactions that will pay off. I mean, Spartan Energy shares were up 45% last week before the deal even happened. Just we, we reported, others reported that they had sort of the leading edge in trying to, you know, make this uh, deal with Fisker. And, uh, you, well, you talk about a hot area. I mean, come on, Tesla's up more than 12% today and above $300 billion in market value. So that particular case, you can kind of understand the reaction. But in terms of SPACs more broadly, you know, I mean, we, we are kind of in a situation where, you know, they can find deals. But it just reminds me, Dave, and, and Vonnie, Dave and I were talking about this in the last hour. When I hear SPACs and some of these things coming into the market, getting the valuations they do, they always make me step back and say, top of the market potentially. Uh, are you hearing any of that, Dave? Well, look, I mean, that is very much an issue at this point when you consider what's going on with Tesla, when you consider what's going on with, you know, the FANG stocks, if you will. You know, you can throw in uh, the likes of uh, Apple and Microsoft in that regard. Yep. Uh, so that that's definitely out there and a lot of comparisons to 1999-2000 in that regard. So the end of that Internet-driven bull market. Now, whether We sold EuroUSD uh, deep. Uh, at 113.17. So right now we in red. You can say like this. Other trades uh, we made. You can you have to go back and you can check that we sold Japanese yen with profit thousand pounds. Okay. So right now I am on Euro USD. I'm waiting again to enter new position for Euro USD. Okay. Hope you understand how it works. N.I. Wilson on your Bloomberg. And if you want to get his chart of the day, just email him at dwilson at bloomberg.net. So this Monday morning, the Nasdaq up one and a quarter percent, the S&P 500 up eight tenths of a percent, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average is up almost one percent, starting things off on a pretty positive footing here, although, as Dave said, not across the board, but the major indices at least, with the dollar index at 96 and a change as well. Let's head now to Washington, D.C., and our Nathan Hager at our 991 Washington Studios. 
Vonnie, the coronavirus surge continues in the Sun Belt. Florida reported more than 15,000 new COVID-19 cases yesterday. That was the most of any state, including New York, since the pandemic began. Miami Mayor Francis Suarez says he's concerned deaths will start to climb as well. Our ventilators are an all-time high, and there's a percentage of people, unfortunately, who are on ventilators who, who do uh, die. That percentage, thankfully, has gone down since the beginning of the pandemic as treatment has improved. But nevertheless, uh, our all-time high uh, back in uh, March, April was 190. Uh, six ventilators. We just uh, eclipsed a 200 mark. Suarez says he can't rule out another round of stay-at-home orders in Miami. Senate Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham says he'll invite former special counsel Robert Mueller to testify before his committee. That's after Mueller published an op-ed in the Washington Post over the weekend defending Roger Stone's conviction after President Trump commuted the sentence for his longtime confidant. House Intelligence Chair Adam Schiff is questioning Graham's motives. Roger Stone was the intermediary between Mr. Trump uh, and Russian intelligence. Stone was directly in communication with Russian intelligence and their cut out WikiLeaks that they were publishing this information. So call me very skeptical about what Lindsey Graham has in mind. As for Stone, he tells Axios he plans to campaign for the president. Former New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson is planning a trip to Venezuela this week where he'll urge President Nicolas Maduro to free several jailed Americans. The Richardson Center announced that on social media. Richardson isn't saying when this meeting will happen or on whose behalf he's working. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg. Quick take powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nathan Hager. This is Bloomberg. How long will it take for the economy to recover? How many of them have remained on the job throughout this? People are not going to be in public transportation. Nobody knows. You have received £600 million in the UK. But we can promise the most complete information and the most detailed analysis. The question is, what kind of recovery will it be? Through every twist and turn. Would you be wary of investment in China at this point? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Melissa from Michigan. I work an extra part-time job serving lunch at my child's school, but I still can't afford to put food on our table. Daniel from California. Choosing whether to pay the rent or pay to fix the car to get to work doesn't leave us with much at all. Now we can't even pay for meals. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. COVID-19, on days when it seems there are nothing but questions. What about the pandemic emergency purchase program in Europe? What's the medical side of this? We try to ask good ones. How long until we have an answer on what drugs can help us fight this pandemic? How do you think this has the potential to rattle markets? Does that mean we should shut down? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. It's a rather controversial question being asked. Bloomberg, the world is listening. My mother was always very active and independent, and she was familiar with her neighborhood. But one day, she stopped at the stop sign for much longer than usual. She wasn't even really sure where she was at. It's very important for you to talk to someone about it. I felt so much better after my son told me, Mom, we'll figure it out. When something feels different, it could be Alzheimer's. Now is the time to talk. Visit alz.org slash ourstories to learn more. A message from the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. The market's in focus. Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Monday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. What would the world be like if we listened more? At Honda, our ears are always open to new ideas. Oh, there's one now, knocking on our eardrum. What's that? What if we made a car with cameras instead of wing mirrors? A robot mower that knows when it's time to cut the grass. A self-balancing motorcycle. 
And what if by 2022, all of our mainstream cars were hybrid or electric? Huh. Great idea. Thanks, ears. Honda. The power of dreams. Give yourself a Diet Coke break. TfL has a plan to help London reopen carefully, safely and sustainably. You can do your bit by continuing to work from home if you can. If you plan to use public transport, you must wear a face covering at all times, avoid peak hours and wash your hands before and after travel. For everyone's safety, we regularly clean our services with antiviral disinfectant and we'll be providing hand sanitizer across our network. For more information, search TfL Restart Plan. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. It's time to look forward to that first dip in the pool, to getting back to what really matters, and to someone else doing the cooking for a change. Look forward to the warm sea breeze against your skin, to carefree days and new adventures, and to smiling from the second you land. Welcome back to Looking Forward. Welcome back to TUI. Discover your smile at All Protected. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. We're all guilty of spending too much time on social media. Why not add something genuinely useful to your feed with TuneIn? Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to learn about some of the best stuff happening around the app. You might just discover your next audio obsession. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Times Radio, an exciting new national speech station, is here. Featuring live news, analysis, conversation, and the unequivocal world-beating journalism of The Times. Join Asma Mir and me, Stig Abel. I'm John Pienaar. Join me on Times Radio. Join me, Mariella Frostra. I'm Giles Corrin. Hello, I'm Kathy Newman. This is Michael Portillo. Join me, Carol Walker. I'm Hugo Rifkin. Times Radio is here. Search Times Radio on TuneIn to listen. At Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Sponsored by Commonwealth Financial Network, delivering the support you need to enrich the lives of your clients and build the business you've always dreamed of. Visit Commonwealth.com to learn more. Stocks are rising as investors brace for earnings that will offer a window into the health of the world's largest economy amid a raging pandemic. The dollar's mixed. Let's take a look at the numbers as we do every 15 minutes. The S&P is up nine tenths of a percent, up 30. The Dow's up 1.1 percent, up 295. And the Nasdaq is up 1.3 percent, up 134. The 10 years down 330 seconds. The yield 0.65 percent. West Texas Intermediate is uh, down three quarters of one percent. Uh, Comex Gold is up six tenths of a percent at 1813.10 per ounce. The dollar yen 107.23. The euro a dollar 13.61. The British pound the dollar 26.29. Analog Devices has agreed to acquire rival Maxim Integrated Products for $20, uh, $20.9 billion in stock, heralding what may develop into a new record uh, round of consolidation in the $400 billion semiconductor industry. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Vonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, it is time now to talk stocks and maybe more broadly the 60-40 mix. A story on Bloomberg today pointing out that it's producing an annual compound rate of return that's way lower than it used to be. In fact, one analyst attached to J.P. Morgan says that actually the return could drop to as much as 3.4% per year. Let's bring in somebody now who can tell us a little bit more about how he's thinking about this. Hans Olsen is CIO at Fiduciary Trust with about $15 billion in assets under management. Hans, the 60-40 mix, is it outdated now? Hi, Vonnie. Good morning. Um, I'm not sure that it, it's, it's 
completely outdated. Uh, without a doubt, the uh, uh, one part of the 60-40 mix, right, the bond piece, as far as producing return, right, the, the yields on bonds now are getting pretty meager indeed. So, you know, that 60-40 mix is going to be somewhat hampered going forward as long as these interest rates remain suppressed. But I'm not sure uh, that it's uh, time to call it over for that mix. So, Hans, if it's not quite over, uh, do we, let's talk about it maybe on a risk-adjusted basis to the extent people want to get returns above 3.5% and they're thinking about a mixture of their portfolio. Are you finding that investor appetite for more risk, whether it's credit risk on uh, you know, the credit side or maybe valuation and business model risk on the equity side? Are you seeing that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think on the uh, fixed income side, it's very interesting to see because you th- you, if you look at yield spreads this year, uh, option-adjusted yield spreads, uh, especially in the high yield market, uh, you know, they were down, what, uh, sub-400 uh, basis points, and they blew out to 1,100 basis points. They've come back down to around 600, so they haven't achieved their, their pre-pandemic uh, levels, which is suggesting to me that both uh, there's an opportunity there and there's some risk to getting priced there as well. High yield bonds, similarly, not as dramatic, but uh, they haven't recovered their pre-pandemic lows as well. They're about 40 percent higher, but, but these are off very uh, small numbers indeed. So I think there's probably an opportunity in some of the fixed income complex, some of the mortgage bonds and the like uh, might make sense uh, given the housing fundamentals. But uh, people, without a doubt, uh, have had to, to search uh, for yield and for return uh, in the fixed income complex. The equity market, uh, you know, there's, there's been a nice bid there. And you know, the way things are looking today, uh, this continues. We could actually be in positive territory year to date on the S&P 500. Hans, what's your primary concern these days? Is it coronavirus and how it could spread and respread throughout the country and how that will affect markets? Or is it something more long term, like perhaps the election? Yeah, I think the thing that I'm struggling with is is sort of the longer term consequences of all the um, extraordinary policy that's been brought to bear. Uh, to battle the pandemic. You know, these things always have a cost, and the cost isn't known to some time after. And the reality is, is that in the data, you know, there's reason to be hopeful that things are beginning to turn. But if you look at Main Street, if you look at sort of where most of commerce happens, things there are, are still really struggling. Um, you know, if you, if you take a walk down your Main Street on a, on a weekend and you look at uh, people out shopping, they're, they're the fraction of the numbers that they were uh, here to four. So I think what we have to do is we have to be looking at sort of like the NIFIB numbers, uh, uh, sort of small business optimism, their hiring plans, their capital spending plans and the like. And that's going to give us a sense of how the real economy is going to move uh, hopefully ahead of, of what the financial economy is telling us right now. So in that regard, Hans, how critical is it for the economy and the markets for another meaningful round of fiscal stimulus? It seems to be being discussed in Congress, but uh, haven't really seen anything yet. Yeah, I mean, I think the market is certainly expecting it for sure, um, uh, without a doubt there. And, and from what at least I see on Main Street, it definitely warranted. My guess is that, look, we're in a presidential uh, election year, right? Uh, a big election year. Uh, Congress, um, there's a lot uh, to play for. And it's, I've never seen uh, a year like this, uh, an election year, where if money needs to be spent, it gets spent. So that, from a political standpoint, tends to be rather easy to do. Uh, it's just the details. Um, and, and so I, w- I would fully expect some sort of fiscal package, an additional fiscal package being launched sometime this summer, um, right ahead of the election. Now, Hans, when you talk about the market pivoting away from the business cycle to a credit cycle, what do you mean? Is, is this a permanent shift? Yeah, so that's that's the uh, getting back to sort of what the longer term issues are. I do think the market has has pivoted away from um, the the traditional business cycle more into a credit cycle, where in the credit cycle the ter- the determinants are the price of money and the availability of money. Right. So prices of money right now they're cheap. Um, availability of money right now um, extremely high, and you see that um, in asset prices. So everything's getting bid. Everything's getting bid, bid pretty well for the most part. Um, but the but you move away from this this idea of, of uh, demand investment uh, productivity driving 
um, economic activity rather than the, the, the forcing of money into the system to create and the hope of creating activity. Um, one's very different than the other. And I think this, this change really happened about 10 years ago. And the problem with this, and I think the longer term consequences of this, is that because you don't let the, the business cycle move through its natural rhythm, you tend to get a zombification of the economy. What we've seen in yep. the in the, uh, uh, the recovery over the last 10 years, it was especially elongated. Uh, and for all the money that we spent, um, the overall lift yep. that we got was, was sort of disappointing. Interesting. Uh, we'll have to see how that continues to play out in markets. Hans Olsen, Chief Investment Officer for Fiduciary Trust, joining us uh, on the phone. Uh, he, uh, Fiduciary Trust is based in Boston. We appreciate that view on the markets here. And again, as uh, Hans was discussing and we've been uh, pointing out this morning, uh, we do have a, uh, a green uh, screen here. We have a early trading here, very positive uh, in the markets, up over slightly 1%. This is Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. Stocks rising as earnings season begins in full force this week. The Dow up more than 200 points. Focus now turns to whether the outlook for profit for all of these companies will back up the bullishness fueled by the Fed and fiscal policy support. We hear from the major banks, including J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup. Two big semiconductor companies are combining. Analog Devices is buying Maxim Integrated Products in a deal worth about $21 billion. Analog is looking for a way to increase competition with the industry's leader, Texas Instruments. Oreo cookie maker Mondelez plans to eliminate a quarter of its products to streamline manufacturing. The company didn't specify which items are on the chopping block. And Disney said it was pretty pleased with the opening of two of its Florida attractions, Magic Kingdom and Animal Kingdom. The company has been criticized for reopening the parks at a time when coronavirus cases are spiking in Florida. Courtney Donahoe, Bloomberg Radio. Listen, as a hiring manager, I've got to tell you, the best job candidate isn't always the typical candidate. Sometimes they're a grad of life. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. Sometimes the best candidates aren't the ones you're used to. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. How long? How much? How many? Financial, policy, and medical experts are working on answers 24-7. What about public debt? We are listening to those experts 24-7. Is the Fed effectively widening this wealth gap with its programs? Because you want answers, too. What's the most important? The trillions in stimulus, the economy's reopening, or the infections curve bending? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Economics. All this doom gloom. Millions of people in the UK struggle to put food on the table. That's why Asda's donated £23 million to Fair Share and the Trussell Trust since 2018. Please help us do more by donating to our Fight Hunger trolleys in store. Asda, we're all in this together. Fair Share and the Trussell Trust of registered charities. See asda.com forward slash fight hunger. Decisions, decisions. Clearing. Isn't it great? So much choice. But hey, listening to me on your desktop isn't getting anything done. You need to take this Monday afternoon by the scruff of the neck. Ignore this gloomy weather and carve your path to success, which begins just down the road in Southampton at Solent University. After three years here, you don't just get a degree. You get a ton of support, real-world experience and connections, and interview fuel. That's why we're in the top 25 for student satisfaction in the Complete University Guide. At Solent University, we're ready for the future. Apply now at solent.ac.uk slash clearing. TfL has a plan to help London reopen carefully, safely and sustainably. You can do your bit by continuing to work from home if you can. If you plan to use public transport, you must wear a face covering at all times, avoid peak hours and wash your hands before and after travel. For everyone's safety, we regularly clean our services with antiviral disinfectant and we'll be providing hand sanitizer across our network. For more information, search TfL Restart Plan. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. At Ring, we've reinvented the doorbell. So no matter where you are or what time of day, you can watch over your home and the things you care about. Ring Video Doorbell streams HD video and two-way talk straight to your phone so you can speak to whoever's at your door from anywhere. Delivery. Oh, great. Can you leave it round the back, please? Sure, no problem. 
and is so simple you can install it yourself in minutes. See, hear and speak to whoever's at your door from wherever you are with Ring Video Doorbell. Available at ring.com and selected retailers. To help keep you and your loved ones safe, tune in as the latest guidelines from the CDC. Home alone or with housemates, stay home as much as possible. Try to allow only people you live with into your home. Wash your hands. If you're sick, stay home and isolate from housemates. For the latest stories and updates on COVID-19, search Coronavirus News on TuneIn. It's TuneIn Sports on this day. On this day in 1979, California's Nolan Ryan and Boston Steve Renko each lose no hitters in the ninth. Eight strikeouts for Ryan. And has his sign. He sets. The pitch to death is just low on the outside part of the plate. And the count one and oh. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. Roughly a fifth of renters may lose their homes by September when pandemic-related eviction freezes are set to expire. Renters in Indiana have until the end of the month before landlords can once again start eviction. It isn't just the pandemic that brought us to this point. Check out this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn Today. Staying current on college hoops starts here on the Eye on College Basketball podcast. CBS Sports columnists Gary Parish and Matt Norlander bring you commentary, insider information, and statistical analysis covering the entire NCAA. The amount of earning potential you could have had there, or if you had gone to play at any other place with a chance to play in the NCAA tournament, win a national championship, none of us would have faulted Cunningham for doing that. But he decided this is where he wants to be in the face of a postseason. Search Eye on College Basketball on TuneIn to listen. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Markets. Coming up at 11 a.m. Eastern, Kevin Cerulli, our Chief Washington Correspondent, will speak with Maryland Governor Larry Hogan about schools reopening and much more. We're also speaking in a moment with Dr. Peter Bach on remdesivir and how much we should actually study it. Before those conversations, let's get to Bloomberg Business Flash and Greg Jarrett. Funny, the S&P is climbing for a second day as traders are waiting for reports from a lot of companies who have yet to provide concrete guidance on the impact of the virus. Shares of Pepsi did go up after the snack maker reported stronger than expected second quarter sales. Let's take a look at the numbers as we do every 15 minutes here on Bloomberg Radio. S&P is up 1.1%, up 35. Dow's up 1.3%, up 351. And the Nasdaq's up 1.5%, up 156. The 10 year is down 132nd with a yield of 0.64%. West Texas Intermediate crude is down 7 tenths of a percent at 4028 a barrel, while Comex Gold's up 4 tenths of a percent at 1809.10 per ounce. The dollar yen, 107.20. The euro's $1.1367, and the British pound, $1.2637. Tesla's relentless surge continued today amid several upcoming events that uh, include the possible unveiling of new battery technology from the electric vehicle maker, entry into a lucrative new market, and the potential inclusion of the stock into the prestigious S&P 500. Tesla is up 12.5% today. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. Bloomberg Opinion, informed perspectives, and expert data-driven commentary on breaking news. It is 1033 on Wall Street, time for Bloomberg Opinion. We're pleased to be joined by Bloomberg Opinion columnist Peter Bach. He's a director at the Center for Health Policy and Outcomes at Memorial Sloan Kettering's Cancer Center uh, in New York City. Dr. Bach, thanks so much for joining us here. Really fascinating column you have out talking about hospitals and the drug that's getting a lot of, uh, I think, press and a lot of attention for treatment, which is remdesivir, give us a sense of kind of how hospitals are viewing this drug, how successful it has proven to be, and what you think its future might be. Well, good morning. Thanks so much for having me. The drug, it's a drug that works against the COVID virus, has some data suggesting it helps speed the recovery of COVID patients. 
and we don't really have a lot of other treatments out there, so there's enthusiasm. But right now there's a shortage. The drug costs a, a tremendous amount of money. It's about $3,000 plus per treatment course. It has no data that demonstrates convincingly it saves lives. And uh, the administration has uh, sought to corner the worldwide market for it so hospitals can use it. Uh, but with all that optimism, my column focuses on two things. One is the data on remdesivir is from a different time, even though it's a few months ago. It was studied on older people. The pandemic has moved to younger people. And it was studied without steroids, dexamethasone specifically, which is clearly showing uh, an ability to save lives. And so now we need to understand, does remdesivir have a place here uh, before we proceed to give it to a bunch of people and spend billions of dollars on it? Dr. Bach, what can we say categorically and scientifically about remdesivir in terms of its relationship with COVID-19? Uh, we can say that there is uh, one study that shows it shortens the duration of illness, uh, and that is about it. That's good news. Uh, don't get me wrong, but this is not the panacea. This doesn't turn around the pandemic. This doesn't mean we can get rid of masks or go back to school or anything like that. We need to make these incremental steps. That's how it always works. And so this is not a disparagement of this piece of progress. It's a fair reckoning with just how big these steps typically are, which is not very. Dr. Buck, you know, I'm reading more and more, I guess we're all reading more and more stories about hospitals in Southern California and Texas and Florida being overrun, no more ICU beds uh, available. It just, it's just a simple replay of what we experienced in the New York metropolitan market back in March and early April. Are you surprised that the hospital system across the country, given what they witnessed in New York metro area, aren't better prepared? No, I'm not. Uh, okay. Part of it is, you know, triumph of hope over experience, uh, the optimism that, you know, it hasn't happened here, so it won't happen uh, ever. But it's also, these are, you know, fixed physical structures. They can't suddenly have four times as many ICU beds. Uh, there are serious limitations to uh, workforce surge. There's not that much supply. There's personal protective equipment, people are scattered across the country and moving people is difficult. And so, no, I'm not surprised at all. We knew from the beginning that our most uh, limited uh, or biggest constraint in handling this pandemic was the healthcare system itself. It was the reason we tried to flatten the curve so we could both get better at treating this and also maintain, if you will, a steady manageable flow of patients, and we have failed to do that even though every other Western country has succeeded, I think because we have foolishly sat around saying, oh, well, we'll get a vaccine soon so we can be casual about this. We've allowed ideology to creep into public health planning, uh, maybe more can creep in. How about trample over? Yeah. And, you know, so I'm not surprised by any of this. And. These hospitals are, I think, you know, pushed to the limit, and they are not designed in almost any cases. I'm placing a new order to buy Japanese yen at 107, 187. So, new order place to buy Japanese yen at 107, 187. large-scale trials that can tell us exactly what it can and can't do when it comes to coronavirus. How do you get around the fact that in a pandemic, people jump on anything that looks like it might work, but for a trial to give us any real information, you need one sick person and one other sick person, one gets the treatment, one doesn't. How do you make that kind of moral judgment at a time like this? Well, it's, you know, this is the foundation of empiric science, that we take our time, that we don't assume our guesses are right. And this isn't some fake humility. This is a hard-learned humility from having been shown over and over again our guesses were wrong. And so we have to do the studies for exactly the reasons you're suggesting there's an argument that we shouldn't be doing them. We are in a crisis that is exploding and expanding around us. What we learn today will have impact on 
10 times, 100 times, potentially 1,000 times as many people down the road. And so that is one element of the moral or ethical underpinning of research. Another is, frankly, we have a remdesivir shortage. So what I'm calling for is let's go do a trial. Let's, it'll take maybe about 2,000 people. We could enroll such a trial, get the patients for it in a matter of days, unfortunately, because of the number of people coming into hospital. Everyone gets dexamethasone, yes. which we know saves lives. Half get remdesivir, half get placebo or some other control. We will Do know in 14 days, in a month, whether or not... Doctor, this we're out of time, well. I'm afraid. We'll, we'll revisit this. Thank you so much. Right now, let's head down to our Washington, D.C. studios for World and National Headlines. We can do that with Nathan Hager. Nathan. Paul, a federal judge has ordered a new delay on federal executions just hours before the first one in nearly 20 years was due to be carried out in Indiana. The Trump administration is likely to ask a higher court to weigh in on this. The new hold came a day after a federal appeals court lifted a stay on the lethal injection of Daniel Lewis Lee. His victim's family had asked for that delay due to COVID-19 concerns. Florida just reported another more than 12,000 coronavirus infections. That's a 4.7 percent increase above the seven-day average. The state also added another 35 deaths. As the pandemic continues, the White House is reportedly trying to sideline its top expert on infectious diseases. The New York Times reports unnamed advisors to President Trump have sent out a list of statements made early in the outbreak by Dr. Anthony Fauci that they say turned out to be inaccurate. More from Bloomberg's Kathleen Hunter. The message essentially coming out of the White House now has been that, you know, Fauci is a doctor. He has a uh, he has a public health perspective. And the implication of that being, you know, that perhaps he doesn't have a broader perspective that also includes the sensitivity to economic implications. A poll taken last month by Siena College finds 67 percent of Americans trust Fauci on the virus compared to 26 percent for President Trump. Under mounting pressure from sponsors and retailers, Washington's NFL team says it will no longer be known as Redskins. The team says it'll retire its name and logo on completion of a review that began July 3rd. For all years, owner Dan Snyder has said he would never change the team's name. Global News on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, makes innovation happen. NJIT faculty mentored Christoph Camacho when he was a student, helping him co-found a startup and patent a device that uses drone technology for reforestation and to collect valuable data for land management. I founded Paratrees back in 2016, taking what I learned from my research at NJIT and migrating it to uh, a startup. Our technology is to really enhance land management operations, so we work very closely with land management companies so we have a drone that performs precision reforestation, and uh, we do storm damage assessment. Having access to drones that can collect data, so it's much faster. And what is more important, we help them drive management decisions. NJIT has been there every step of the way, going full force with my company. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. Asset managers who seize change to launch new strategies, add distribution channels, or exploit new technology to re-engineer the position open in um, Japanese yen at 107.187. Strategically, yet the most competitive managers in the market know with the right partner and a flexible operating system, you can. Go boldly toward change with SEI Investment Manager Services. I'm Steve Meyer, president of SEI's Investment Manager Services. At SEI, we understand the emerging forces that will define success for asset managers and what firms will need to compete tomorrow. That's why we continually optimize SEI's global operating platform. If your business requires greater agility, our advanced technology, integrated best-in-class systems, and multi-asset expertise can be your catalyst for business transformation. With SEI Investment Manager Services, you lead the charge in a competitive marketplace. Learn more at seic.com slash seize change. Where are today's real testing grounds? Millions of people in the UK struggle to put food on the table. That's why Asda's donated £23 million to Fair Share and the Trussell Trust since 2018. Please help us do more by donating to our Fight Hunger trolleys in store. Asda, we're all in this together. Fair Share and the Trussell Trust of registered charities. See asda.com forward slash fight hunger. What have you missed the most? A haircut? 
A visit to the shops. Oh, you look lovely in that. What about a nice lunch? Fish and chips, please. It's all winning with that. Or an afternoon in a pub garden. <laughs> Fancy a casual bike ride? Or perhaps something a little more intense? <laughs> or maybe you want a relaxing day out? Whatever you've missed, get out there and enjoy it again safely. Find out how at gov.uk forward slash enjoy summer safely. And action. I was offered one. Cut. That's not on the script. I was offered one. Get it. Ladies and gentlemen, I was offered one. Come, boy. I was offered one. Don't say you can't work for it. Nine out of ten people said they were offered a great value deal with O2. Get yours today, in store, online, or by phone. I was offered one too. O2 Retail Exit Survey 309 of 348 agreed with the statement. O2 offered me a great value deal. For full verification, see o2.co.uk forward slash terms. At Ring, we've reinvented the doorbell. So no matter where you are or what time of day, you can watch over your home and the things you care about. Ring Video Doorbell streams HD video and two-way talk straight to your phone. So you can speak to whoever's at your door from anywhere. Delivery. Oh, great. Can you leave it around the back, please? Sure, no problem. And it's so simple, you can install it yourself in minutes. See, hear and speak to whoever's at your door from wherever you are with Ring Video Doorbell. Available at ring.com and selected retailers. Roughly a fifth of renters may lose their homes by September when pandemic-related eviction freezes are set to expire. Renters in Indiana have until the end of the month before landlords can once again start eviction. It isn't just the pandemic that brought us to this point. Check out this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn Today. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. This is Mike Gola Jr. from ESPN's Golik and Wingo. Every morning, Wingo Dad and I sit down and discuss all the news, drama, and highlights spinning the sports world that day. And with TuneIn, you can hear us whenever and wherever you go. Just search Golik and Wingo to start listening today. We're all guilty of spending too much time on social media. Why not add something genuinely useful to your feed with TuneIn? Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to learn about some of the best stuff happening around the app. You might just discover your next audio obsession. Where do sports, culture, and basketball nostalgia collide? On their podcast, Knuckleheads, NBA veterans Quinton Richardson and Darius Miles sit down with athletes, musicians, and entertainers to get brutally honest, totally unguarded conversations about everything from current events to untold stories from the golden era of sports. Kill O'Neal. You know that, right? I tried to tip dunk all the free throw line one Search time. Search Knuckleheads on TuneIn to listen. You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Stocks are up as investors turn their focus to major companies that are reporting earnings this week, offering a look at how the coronavirus pandemic is affecting operations at those major companies. We check the markets every 15 minutes. The s and is up nine tenths of a percent, up 30. The Dow's up 1.2 percent, up 308. And the Nasdaq surges. It's up 1.4 percent, up 146. The 10 years down 132nd with a yield of 0.64 percent. West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil is down eight tenths of a percent at 4021 a barrel. Comex Gold's up four tenths of a percent at 1809.20 an ounce. The dollar yen 107.21. The euro is a dollar 13.68. The British pound the dollar 26.24. Add one more unlucky investor ensnared in waste management's uh, 23 billion excuse me three billion dollar weeks long debt tussle. Uh, would be the Federal Reserve. The central bank bought about $3 million of the company's bonds due in 2024, about uh, 105 cents to the dollar. But now they'll be redeemed at 101 cents tomorrow. That'll amount to roughly $120,000 lost in principal on the debt purchased on June 23rd. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney and Bonnie Quinn on Bloomberg Radio. 
Well, one of the byproducts of this pandemic is it's just kind of exacerbating or highlighting some of the tensions between a lot of nations across uh, the world. And clearly it's a unique time here. And one of the questions is how will the new world order look post-pandemic as we think about uh, kind of how the United States may or may not lead and how your positioning of Europe and so on. So there's no one better to discuss these big, big geopolitical issues. And Alan Crawford, senior editor, international government for Bloomberg News, joins us on the phone from Berlin. Uh, Alan, thanks so much for joining us here. You're out with a story a few days ago. A new world order for the coronavirus era is starting to emerge. Give us a sense of how you think this new world order may look. Well, I I think we all get the feeling that there's something momentous underway. And so I try to take a step back to take a look at um, where we are six months in. And already there are definite trends that we see that um, the U.S., um, I I have to say, from an outside perspective, it just looks, regardless of the the politics, it just looks as if it's increasingly self-absorbed. Uh, ahead of going into the November election, of course, but also with the, the pandemic, it's having to fight this this terrible um, virus and um, it's occupied um, as far as the outside world is concerned. But then, of course, we're seeing China, for, for reasons of its own that I don't think are completely understood, It's it, there are these high frictions with countries from Canada to Australia to the UK over Hong Kong, um, and of course with the US as well, uh, and these are all coming together at once. And then Europe is in this kind of strange in-between position where it's trying to, it, there are signs it may just emerge from this uh, crisis stronger. What will be the decisive moment at which it really becomes obvious that China has already sort of become a bigger figure in world politics than maybe the US and Europe had given it credit for? Well, I mean, if we're looking at the six months ahead, then obviously um, the U.S. election is a huge, um, it's the elephant in the room, if you like. And certainly the, the, the analysts that I spoke to, they were somewhat wary about um, um, conflicts ahead. I'm not talking about open conflict, but, you know, tensions, more frictions ahead of the November election. I'm placing a stop on profit for Japanese yen at... 107.207. So stop on profit at 107.207. That it will give me about 200 pounds in profit if it will close below this price. Up to China, or do they basically try and keep their head down? And I think that there's a sense that that. Their decision will actually go a long way towards um, determining um, the approach to China. So it's interesting here. We're going to. You mentioned the election, and let's just say, for argument's sake, that the that uh, Vice President Biden wins the election. Does the does his Secretary of State spend the first 100 days of administration simply on a plane traveling around to all these countries saying? That, okay, those last four years, just forget them. We're going back to business as, as usual. We are your friend. We will be part of the solution. We will lead you against, you know, whether it was a Cold War 30, 40 years ago to whatever it is we have in the future. I, I think undoubtedly that would be the case. But what effect that would have, I'm not sure. Because on the one hand, yes, there was room to improve relations. Um, on the other, then... Really, the tensions between, for example, um, European countries, um, France, Germany, uh, with the with the Trump administration, then that has really highlighted Europe's um, Europe's dependence on the U.S., which is a, is a it, it's obviously it goes back to the Second World War uh, and all of the help that uh, the U.S. has given. Moving moving further, my stop on profit for Japanese yen. To 107, 17. Sorry, 107, 217, yeah? 17. <laughs> We're not going down. We're going up, yeah? All right. So 107, 217. Kissinger and Neil Ferguson talking about a, you know, a new Cold War between the U.S. and China. Those things, though, are quite hyperbolic 
where is there any evidence that there will actually be sort of a breakout of conflict, you know, soft or hard between, uh, you know, the, the, the bipolar countries in this war? Well, certainly one of the analysts that I was speaking to who sits in Singapore, then he said that, um, that his greatest concern uh, going forward, and, and he's talking um, short to medium term, is not that there's some kind of open conflict between the US and, and China, because the governments obviously realize that that's, uh, it, it would be catastrophic. His concern is more that there is some kind of like basically mistake, some kind of error in, in these high percentage areas such as the South China Sea, where, you know, the U.S. has sent two aircraft carriers through recently, uh, and that, that there's more, uh, it's, it's basically um, a, an accident that could happen. That's, that's what the concerns are, um, in, um, certainly among the, the analyst community. Hmm. So, Alan, what's the, the consensus of the European Union and Brexit and what the role the UK may play here in a post-Brexit world in terms of the world order? Well, that's a good question. That's actually my next story. Okay, <laughs> we'll preview that. I'm working on. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the UK is in a difficult position. Moving up again, my stop on profit for Japanese yen to 107.227. One one seven two three seven. Okay, let's stop here. Huawei, that's not, not unique to the UK, of course. But these are these are decisions which will have potentially very deep ramifications for its relations as an independent country, a middling power. Uh, when it's having to deal with um, the superpowers of, of, of China, but also with the, uh, any, uh, with either the Trump administration, which is friendly and wants a trade deal, or the Biden, a uh, Biden administration, we don't know what their position would be on on uh, on uh, post Brexit UK and a trade deal. Alan, looking forward to seeing that story, but this particular story you have out uh, this this morning in the last couple of days is fascinating. I'd urge everybody to read it. Alan Crawford is Senior Editor for International Government at Bloomberg News, and his story is a new world order for the coronavirus era is starting to emerge. And it is an interesting question, Paul, to talk about who Joe Biden might pick, you know, in terms of foreign policy. We know already that he is the former uh, CIA Deputy Director on a potential transition team were he to become President at some point. And, um, you know, it, it, it looks like there might be, you know, quite a, a forceful stance there. Everything seems to be in motion. What have you missed the most? A haircut? A visit to the shops? Oh, you look lovely in that. What about a nice lunch? Fish and chips, please. Salt and vinegar with that. Or an afternoon in a pub garden. <laughs> Fancy a casual bike ride? Or perhaps something a little more intense? <laughs> or maybe you want a relaxing day out. Whatever you've missed, get out there and enjoy it again safely. Find out how at gov.uk forward slash enjoy summer safely. Eurotunnel Le Chateau is a safer way to get to France and beyond with social distancing built in. There's no scrum at security, hanging around for your bags or shouldering strangers in your seat. With Eurotunnel Le Chateau, simply drive on at Folkestone and stay in your car comfortably. Then drive off 35 minutes later. Stay safe. Go Tunnel. Eurotunnel. Le Chateau. A safer way to France and beyond. Nothing phases the money Campbell because his bills are under control with Money Supermarket. Even this. The dentist. Not a flicker of anxiety. Fox is making love. This laugh. <laughs> He's calmer than a banana. So, be like the money calm bull. Get money calm. Money supermarket. Trey Wingo here from ESPN's Golik and Wingo. Every morning, Mike Golik, Mike Golik Jr., and I sit down to discuss all the news, drama, and highlights spinning the sports world that day. And with TuneIn, you can hear us whenever and wherever you go. Just search Golik and Wingo to start listening today. 
Looking for your daily fix of NFL news and analysis? In that. So we had to blow it up at the Super Bowl predictions instead. Just... Look no further than the Pick 6 podcast, where CBS sports writer Will Brinson gets you up to speed with what's trending in the NFL that day so that you're always in the know. Yeah, it's pretty revealing of Brinson's methodology for predictions. When he gets mad at people for predicting good teams are going to win the Super Bowl or good players are going to win major awards, that's how you wind up. Search Pick 6 on TuneIn to listen. Who says you can't have a laugh while getting serious about America's pastime? On the daily podcast, Locked on MLB, comedian and baseball fanatic Paul Francis Sullivan talks about each team, each pennant race, and everything else in the game, from rule changes and controversies to baseball cards and stadium food. For those of you who are not familiar with me or the old show, I love to obsess over baseball. I'm talking baseball over the Super Bowl. We had a TV show in the Division Series during my wedding. Search Locked on MLB on TuneIn to listen today. Today at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take, this is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Markets with Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney. Will technology lead us out of this crisis? We don't know how many companies can accept people back on their roster. The Fed seems to have really flexed its muscles. There's still a coronavirus risk. Breaking market news and insight from Bloomberg experts. To ring out that by-the-dip mentality, that takes time. Are we looking at a more damaging break in the labor market? Does the shape of the yield curve matter? We're looking at late 2021, early 2021. 22, where it really feels quote unquote normal. This is Bloomberg Markets with Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Coming up in just a couple of moments, we're going to have Maryland Governor Larry Hogan. He speaks with Bloomberg's Chief White House Correspondent Kevin Cerulli. Plus, R.J. Gallo, Senior Portfolio Manager uh, at Federated Hermes. We're going to get his thoughts on the bond market. But first, let's go to Greg Jarrett of Bloomberg News for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Greg. All stocks are up, all on expectations that earnings will offer an optimistic look into the U.S. economy amid a raging pandemic. The dollar is mostly lower. Why don't we take a look at the numbers as we uh, have a tendency to do every 15 minutes. The S&P is up 1.25%, up 40. The Dow is up 1.5%, up 386. And the Nasdaq is up 1.7%, up 176. The 10 years down 330 seconds. The yield is 0.65%. West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil is down a tenth of a percent at 40.49 a barrel. Comex Gold's up a half a percent at 18.1180 an ounce. The dollar yen 107.26. The euro is a dollar 13.70, and the British pound a dollar 26.19. Bill Ackman's Blank Check Company has increased the size of its IPO, aiming to raise four billion dollars for an unspecified acquisition. Pershing Square Tontine Holdings is now marketing 200 million units for twenty dollars a piece according to a regulatory filing today. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg Markets continues now. Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney. All right, we have Governor Larry Hogan coming up in a few moments, but first we want to get a look at small caps and how they're performing today. Is it an update for small caps too? Let's get to Dave Wilson. It's an update, Bonnie, but not as much of an update for sure. The Russell 2000 index only higher by four-tenths of a percent, while the S&P 500 is up 1.3%. That said, the Russell's biggest game belongs to Benefit Technologies, whose ticker is BFYT. The health insurance marketplace has risen 37.5% after agreeing to a $410 million takeover by private equity firm Madison Dearborn. Vaxart, ticker VXRT, has climbed more than 28%. The COVID-19 vaccine developer received a buy rating in new coverage at B. Riley FBR. And Rigel Pharmaceuticals, ticker RIGL, has added 13.5%. Citigroup highlighted a study indicating the company's treatment for a blood disorder may help with lung damage from the coronavirus. The Russell Steve Pastrop belongs to Gritstone Oncology, ticker GRTS. The cancer vaccine developer has plunged almost 49% after presenting data on a conference call about two proposed treatments. And Next Cure, ticker NXTC, has fallen almost 44.5%. The drug developer said it would scale back the next stage of research on a proposed cancer treatment. Bloomberg Stocks Editor Dave Wilson, thank you so much for that small cap update. We appreciate that. Let's switch over, take a look at the state of Maryland. Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland, he sits down with Bloomberg Chief White House Correspondent Kevin Cirilli, for a conversation on schools reopening, the COVID response, and the political climate. Let's take a listen. 
Governor Hogan, thanks for being with us. Well, thanks, I want to ask you about a pressing matter of the day, and that's whether or not families are going to be able to send their students back to the classroom come September. Boy, we sure hope so, but we're, um, you know, we want to get, everybody wants to get kids back to school because it's so important that they, you know, we get them back learning again, but we've got to do it in a safe way, and so we're working uh, very carefully with our state superintendent of schools and our local school boards and getting lots of input from our public health uh, doctors and our, uh, our scientists along with our teachers and parents, and just, uh, we're going to come up with a plan that's probably going to be some kind of a hybrid that makes sure that we get our kids uh, educated and back to school, but in a very safe way. How do you make sure that the private schools don't have an advantage versus the public schools and all of the different types of towns and communities that might have different coronavirus rates? How do you make sure it's fair for every student? Well, we want to make sure that all our kids are safe, uh, regardless of uh, whether they're going to a private school or whether they're going to a public school, and regardless of which community they're in. We're giving some flexibility to local jurisdictions who may be in different uh, positions the, from one, one jurisdiction to another. Uh, but overall, our state, knock on wood, so far is doing much better than most other places around the country. We've got declining rates, declining positivity rate, declining hospitalization, declining deaths, declining ICU beds. So uh, we're, we're keeping a close eye on it, and we're, we're by no means out of the woods on this thing. Uh, but we're, uh, we're going to be very careful to make sure we do it right. And our kids, I know parents are anxious to get their kids back in school. They're also really concerned about their health. And what about teachers? Because teachers are also, they have a different set of concerns. Teachers are, have, have a right to be very concerned. That's why we're working so closely with the teachers, we're working together with our local school boards to get their input. We've got to keep them safe. We've got to make sure that we go about this in a very careful way. What do you need from the federal government? Because in Washington, D.C., we're staring down another battle of another round of economic stimulus. What do you need to see coming from Washington? Well, so, uh, you know, as the chairman of the National Governors Association, we've been fighting and pushing since March to try to get some assistance from the federal government. We were uh, we fought to try to get uh, help to the state and local governments in the third stimulus package. Next week, when uh, uh, when Congress comes back from, the, from their Fourth of July, recess, we're hoping, uh, we've been pushing very hard to make sure that the state and local governments are included in that stimulus package because it's critically important. We've already lost 1.5 million state and local government workers just wow. in the past 60 days. It's anticipated we could lose as many as 4 million more. So we're talking about, you know, frontline health care workers and teachers and police and firefighters, you know, people that we're out there providing more services under very difficult circumstances. And, and we're as impacted at the state and local government level as, as our businesses uh, because of the revenues are down dramatically. Uh, across, the, across the country, we're expecting uh, a de decrease in revenues to state governments of up to 30%. 1.5 million jobs already lost, and you just said 4 million jobs potentially could be lost, and that's for, for government workers. Alone. Yeah, state and local government workers. And uh, so we're working very hard. We've been pushing the administration, working with uh, leaders in Congress on both sides of the aisle, in the House and the Senate. And we're hopeful uh, that sometime by the end of July we're going to get we're going to have some success and get some help because states are making very uh, difficult budget decisions and uh, putting together their budgets and looking at dramatic uh, you know reductions in staff. And in many ways, you know, a government job was seen as a safe job. So when you when you're talking to President Trump, when you're talking to Speaker Pelosi, what do you specifically want them to know? I want them to know that not only as we're trying to have this economic recovery. Uh, the, the worst thing we could possibly do is to put more people on the unemployment lines and to those folks that are actually trying to help the other people that are in need. Um, so we need more money and not less money for local governments. And, uh, and, and the federal government is, the, is this is one thing that the states cannot do without the federal government. So. Governor, in, your, in the excerpts for your book, Still Standing, which comes out in just a, a few short weeks, you, you outline yourself as, as sort of a pragmatic conservative. And you know this as we're staring down this debate with Republicans who I've interviewed in the past several weeks are very concerned about more bailouts, more government money, more types of government assistance sure. in order to prevent uh, some layoffs. And they're saying, we can't afford to take on this debt. What do you say to your, the Republicans in the would, party for that? Way? I would say we're in a very unique situation where we can't afford not to. So I'm a lifelong Republican. I'm a conservative. I'm a lifelong small business owner who's never held elective office before I ran for governor. 
I ran for governor uh, with my sole mission was to turn around our state economy. Uh, we had killed businesses and jobs. We, uh, we were 49th out of 50 states in overall economic performance. I came in and immediately I cut taxes six years in a row. Um, we had more job growth, more businesses open than ever before in the history of our state. state. Uh, we had the best economic turnaround in America. So I'm a, I'm a governor who normally would be on the same side of those folks saying, hey, we don't need more government spending. We don't need more debt. Uh, in this particular case, though, we've got the worst ec economy uh, since really the Great Depression, it's worse than the Great Recession, uh, and we need that stimulus to help keep the people in our state employed and to keep our economy from tanking even further. Now, we're doing even better in this uh, economic collapse. Uh, we have about a 9% unemployment, which is terrible. It's three times what it was before COVID. But there are states, uh, all, many other states across the country, that are 25, 23, 21 percent. We're doing much better than the country. We're doing much better than most of the other states in the country. But it's a really bad situation. You know, and I was walking down uh, to down the street uh, by the uh, by all the boats, and I was getting a cup of coffee. I saw uh, this is where the reopening starts. Essentially, there was a sign. So, how do you, Governor? make get ready for the economic comeback or what needs to be done to make sure that there is that economic comeback uh, not just in Maryland but across the country so we have been uh, we're focused on these dual crises at the same time how do we keep people safe and how do we can, can grow our economy and keep people working keep businesses afloat and it's very difficult we um, kept more businesses open than a lot of people did we kept all of our essential businesses open the whole time but we tried to go about it in a very safe way we, uh, we lifted our st uh, stay-at-home order back in April, uh, so it's been quite a while that we've been open. About 95% of all of our, our businesses are able to operate, but they're doing it in a safe way with masking and distancing and um, lots of safety precautions. And our numbers on the health side have been very, very good, some of the best in the country. Uh, but our economy, is, and it's, our economy is much better now than it was in June and better than it was in May, better than it was in April. But it's still very slow, gradual growth because until people feel safe and feel confident, until there's a vaccine, until people feel like it's okay uh, to go to a restaurant or, or go out in public, the economy is not going to rebound quickly. So it's going to take some time. I want to go broad and then I want to I ask you about mail-in voting because in your book, Still Standing, you talk about being a paper delivery boy. <laughs> Literally, you were you were in the you were in the news business, Gov. I, I started in journalism, uh, <laughs> ten years old, delivering and, the paper. And you talk about how at, at that at that time, I mean, your your father was uh, prior to to being in Congress was was worked for the federal government. So when you're talking about people losing their jobs who work for the government, this is something that that, that you know a thing or two about. What needs to be structurally changed in this country to make sure that everyone across the board, regardless of where they live, whether it's in inner city Baltimore or out in rural Maryland, that they can have the same opportunity? Because a lot of people feel like this is just not a fair system that we live in. Well, I talk about in my book some of the ways that we grew our economy here in Maryland over the past six years. And so I, I came in, my first two years were under President Obama. The, the, the next uh, three and a half years were under President Trump. But from the day we took over, we changed the direction of our state to say Maryland is open for business. We grew jobs in every part of our state. Uh, unemployment was cut in half in everywhere, including Baltimore City and including some of our most difficult places. We've in, uh, put more investment and more time into job training and workforce development, uh, more investment into uh, enterprise zones and investing money into our, our challenged uh, communities and redeveloping some of our older communities. And we have, we were making tremendous success. And then we're hit with this, uh, this economic a catastrophe that's the worst in our lifetime and now we've got to figure out a way uh, to continue to make success and come back out of this uh, because America will come out of it uh, stronger than ever but it's going to take some time and a lot of people are suffering in the meantime all right we're just a couple of months away from a presidential election and elections across the country there's a debate happening right now about mail-in voting and whether or not that should be the dominant way that people vote come November 3rd 
What are you doing in Maryland, and what's your position on what the right course of action should be? You know, I think we, what we're doing here in Maryland is an all-of-the-above uh, voting system where you can vote by mail, you can vote early with early voting, or you can vote on Election Day. We attempted to do an, uh, a, a, vote, a mail-in only uh, situation in the primary elections, and there were some real difficulties with our independent state board of elections that couldn't administer it properly, and we had only a handful of precincts open that were overloaded and overcrowded which was a tough situation. So this time we just decided to go forward with let's encourage everybody who can to vote by mail. Um, if those who can't or, or, or don't want to can vote, go to an early voting uh, center, uh, distance safe uh, with all the PPE that they need, and some people can still go and vote on Election Day. So if we spread it out over all three of those things, hopefully we'll give every single person a chance to vote. Uh, make sure we get maximum participation, and we'll do it in a safe way. If people want to vote by mail, do they have the right to do so? Do they have to request a ballot? We're going to send out an absentee ballot request to every single registered voter in the state. A request? Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that there were some challenges. There's this debate that's been happening right now. I'm, I'm curious, is it is it your position that we're just too close to the election day to try to change this dramatically for the entire country? And, and are other governors saying that? And if, is, should this have been a conversation that was had two or three years ago as opposed to just a couple of months before November 3rd? Well, you know, we're in this crisis, so uh, it's a little bit, uh, you know, we're trying to address the problems of keeping people safe while also encouraging people to vote. And so it's hard to figure it out, and each state is going about it a little bit differently, and I know there's a big argument about whether you should be able to vote by mail or not. We've been doing that for 20 years in our state, and it works very well. We're just trying to make it easier and encourage more people to do that. But there are a certain percentage of the people that, um, if, uh, that, that still, as we showed in our primary, still want to show up and vote. We're going to make sure that they can do so in a safe way. But it's very difficult. So in less than 110 days uh, till the election, and to change all of the precincts across the country, it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting debate, but it's also a challenging uh, logistical problem. Governor Hogan of Maryland, we appreciate you coming on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Well, thank you very much. And that was Ron Kevin Cirelli there, Chief White House Correspondent, speaking with the Governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan. And, of course, ending on something a little bit uh, controversial, Governor Hogan, of course, adding the extra step of absentee ballot applications, which would then have to be processed. And, of course, we know what happened in Wisconsin. All right, let's get now to 99.1 Studios in Washington, D.C., where we have Nathan Hager with World and National News. Bonnie, continuing to watch the coronavirus outbreak. Florida has reported another 12,600 new COVID-19 infections. That is below the record set yet. We close position on Japanese yen at 107,237. And we got 500 pounds in profit. Not bad, yeah. Uh, how long we was holding this position, as you can see. We had this right here at 20 to 4, yeah, until 10 to past 4 for about half an hour. Good trade. Well done, anybody who followed our, our trade with this um, pair. Let's see what's next. Both killed in a gun battle. A hospital chief says many of the wounded in this attack are civilians, including children. Firefighters are still battling the flames aboard a Navy combat ship docked in San Diego where an explosion left at least 57 people hurt. This fire began yesterday morning aboard the USS Bonamy Richard, apparently in a vehicle storage area, as that ship was in a berth undergoing maintenance. Initially, 17 sailors and four civilians were reported hurt, but by early this morning, that number had grown to 57. Five are still in the hospital. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg. Quick take powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. And Nathan Hager, this is Bloomberg. You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Busy morning we've had so far. We still have more to go. Lots to talk about here. Getting a quick data check for you right here. Markets uh, still positive territory. The S&P up 1.3%. That's uh, about 41 points. 32.26. Dow Jones doing a little bit better up 1.5%. Uh, That's 395 points. That puts the Dow at 26,470. And the leader 
of the big three indices is the tech-heavy NASDAQ up 1.8%. That puts it at 10,807. So equity markets uh, doing very well. Taking a look at the fixed income markets just real quickly before we get to our next guest. Look at the 10-year Treasury yield. Pretty unchanged here, down 230 seconds, pushing the 10-year yield up just slightly to 0.65%. Uh, so pretty steady there in the Treasury market, which brings us to RJ Gallo, Senior Portfolio Manager, and he's head of the Municipal Bond Group at Federated Hermes. Uh, they, he manages over $11 billion. We appreciate him always coming on the show to give us his perspective about the fixed income markets, including the municipal bond market. RJ, thanks so much for joining us here. Again, uh, kind of a risk-on feel to the markets here over the past, obviously, uh, several weeks, a couple months after we hit that bottom back in late March, early April. What's your kind of, as you step back and take a look at your overall expanse of your coverage, what you guys own across your portfolios, What's most attractive to you right now? Maybe what are you maybe a little bit concerned about here? Well, it's a great question. Thanks, as always, for having me. You know, um, I think that it's important to realize how far the markets have come since March. Uh, Massive monetary intervention, massive fiscal stimulus, more of that likely to be coming in a phase four, has caused risk assets and fixed income to do extraordinarily well, um, you know, since March. And as a firm uh, within our portfolios that can scan across different fixed income sectors, we've, we've played it pretty well. We've added to mortgages at the right time, pulled that back off, added the investment grade corporates as the Fed was getting involved there, which obviously is historic within the context of monetary policy at least. Uh, and that's boosted performance to investment grade corporates. A high yield, we've been a little bit more cautious, although we own it, we've just been a little bit more cautious. We also added the munis. At one point when muni ratios were you know, three to four to five times higher than a treasury, that was a tilly valuation, and that's played really well. I go over this because, like, the easy money feels like it's been made. Uh, and at this point, it's more incremental. Um, and a lot is now turning from valuations that were distorted by liquidity shock and credit fear to now the really dissecting what's going to happen with corporate earnings, what's going to happen with the recovery now that we've clearly, I think, put in a bottom on the economy, but we still have challenges going forward as the infections are spreading in different areas of the country. RJ, I want to talk to you a little bit about the municipal market and what we might see in terms of changes, particularly around schools, municipalities, towns, states, that sort of thing. We've just got a headline from Larry Kudlow, advisor to the White House, obviously saying that President Trump is willing to mull more state aid if schools reopen. Now, the reason that this is so uh, sort of on point and, you know, a bit of a flashpoint is that President Trump had threatened to withdraw school funding if schools didn't reopen in the fall. But, of course, he doesn't really have the ability to do that. That's a congressional mandate. Now it looks like, you know, he's, he's willing to mull more state aid or to direct Congress to, to hand out more state aid if schools reopen. Whether it happens or not is, is one thing. But what, what, what does the muni market look like? Is there appetite to sort of fund more state aid? Well, I think it's, it's important that Phase 4 includes aid to state and local governments. The CARES Act had direct funding for states and for some localities. States were also able to pass through to their localities that they chose to. But the CARES Act restricted the use of that $150 billion to COVID-related expenses. It didn't allow the states or the local governments to use it for lost revenue. That should be eased up. They should allow that money to be used for lost revenue. And then an additional tranche is important. If you look at the employment data, we've seen sharp drops in state and local government employment already. Uh, In some cases, it's back to where it was years ago. That is going to be a major headwind to to the economy and to the labor markets, which seem to be healing, admittedly, but that will be a, a big problem if state and local governments keep laying people off. And I think lastly, on credit, the, uh, the larger states didn't do as well in the CARES Act. The CARES Act was, was distributed in such a way that smaller states really benefited. Um, I, I hope that this time around that there is a, a, a more appropriate balance between uh, the size of states and, and the COVID experience of states that then occurred in the last round. Uh, all in all, on school reopening, Public health is important. Safety is important. I don't want to wade into what is a political issue, but it shouldn't be a political issue. It should be a question of safety and the educational experience that that students and teachers can have within the school buildings. It's sad that it's becoming uh, a a political issue, in my personal opinion. So, RJ, if you take a look at some of the the states out there, I mean, most of the states have a balanced budget amendment. How is the admissible bond market looking at some of these states like, you know, California and and, and New York and these that are 
talking about multi-billion dollar uh, budget shortfalls. I mean, it almost screams you have to get some aid or there will just be transformational uh, cuts uh, in expenditures. How is the municipal bond market looking at some of those big states? It, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, the, the bigger states that have the more red ink, um, there is history here. Although this is a downturn of a proportion that we have not seen, the last downturn, the global financial crisis, wasn't exactly a walk in the park either. And many states experienced sharp revenue declines then. They also experienced help from the you know, what we came to know as the Obama stimulus back then. But it didn't fill all the gaps either. And what ended up happening, big states like California, if I recall correctly, I think S&P did some research. I think that California cut uh, $2.00 in spending for every one dollar in which they raise revenue through taxation. Um, they didn't default on their debt. That's the one thing that I think people have to always understand is that we've been through downturns in recessions before. And municipal entities that have to balance their budgets, as you noted, um, have a history of how they do it. Uh, it's typically somewhat balanced between revenue increases and expenditure cuts. I think right now, with where state tax rates are, some states might not feel they have a lot of ability to increase taxation. That might be true for some locals, too. Uh, and that means that if you don't give them additional assistance in phase four, we'll probably feel it more on the expenditure cut side. And that is a challenge for many elements of the private sector, public sector that rely upon services from the state and local government entities. So it is an important time, uni credit wise. I think we're pretty comfortable that we're going to see another element of federal funding in CARES 4, and it'll help to relieve some of these stresses. Obviously, the big picture, how strong will the recovery be? What's the trade-off between economic growth, economic activity, and infection? What happens with the vaccine? I mean, all markets still hinge on all those things. Munis do, too. RJ, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for joining us this morning, RJ Gallo, joining us there, and particularly giving us his expertise as head of the Municipal Bond Group at Federated Hermes in terms of municipalities and uh, the Bloomberg noting today that Muni sales are set for $11.1 billion worth led by New York and Texas. So really it's it's just a phenomenally sized market and uh, these, are, these are state and local debt maturing in 10 years, Paul. Yeah, exactly. And that, I think that uh, his comments about the federal stimulus in, you know, being directed to states and local municipalities is absolutely key. All right. RJ Gallo there. Tune in for more Bloomberg Radio. This is the Bloomberg Money Minute. Stocks jumping with the Dow rising more than 400 points as we kick off earnings season this week. Traders are waiting on results and outlooks from a slew of companies to get concrete guidance on the impact of coronavirus. OPEC is preparing its next move, the cartel looking into how to unwind unprecedented output cuts. OPEC and its allies hold an online summit Wednesday, and we're seeing crude little changed ahead of that meeting, $40 a barrel. Tesla's relentless surge continues on several upcoming events. That includes a possible unveiling of new battery technology from the electric vehicle maker. The company said its Battery Day event will be held September 22nd. And Chipotle plans to test cauliflower rice as an alternative to its traditional grains. The new option will be sold in 55 restaurants in Denver and across Wisconsin starting this week. The move underscores the fast food industry's efforts to appeal to health-conscious customers. Courtney Donahoe, Bloomberg Radio. To buy your home, you became a house hunting ace. Learned about loans, scoured neighborhoods, and asked the right questions. Now you're queen of your castle. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. With 401k tips and smart saving strategies, you'll feel empowered to own your retirement like you own your home. Go to aceyourretirement.org. Because when it comes to clearing financial hurdles, you're an ace. Brought to you by AARP. And the, ad council. the doors are opening. When is that moment out in the distant future? Some things will be as they were. Others forever changed. The restaurant industry will never be the same. Follow every new development here on Bloomberg Radio. What do we need in terms of maybe the new school of economic thought? Because the next best thing to magic is insight. It may take nearly a decade for the U.S. economy to recover. Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. 
economics. All this doom and gloom was out there funny. Millions of people in the UK struggle to put food on the table. That's why Asda's donated £23 million to Fair Share and the Trussell Trust since 2018. Please help us do more by donating to our Fight Hunger trolleys in store. Asda, we're all in this together. Fair Share and the Trussell Trust of registered charities. See asda.com forward slash fight hunger. What have you missed the most? A haircut? A visit to the shops. Oh, you look lovely in that. What about a nice lunch? Fish and chips, please. Salt and vinegar with that. Or an afternoon in a pub garden. <laughs> Fancy a casual bike ride? Or perhaps something a little more intense? <laughs> or maybe you want a relaxing day out. Whatever you've missed, get out there and enjoy it again safely. Find out how at gov.uk forward slash enjoy summer safely. Formula One is back. F1 is back on Sky Sports. It's lights out and away we go. And there's never been a season like this before. How was that fast? No one knows where this road leads, but it's going to be a hell of a ride. Are you ready? Brilliant madness. An absolutely perfect race. Watch every race live. Upgrade to Sky Sports F1 today. Go to sky.com forward slash F1 for details. Are you fully informed on the NBA? On the NBA Hangtime podcast, veteran sports writers Seku Smith and John Schumann analyze the latest NBA news, storylines, and discussions with guests from around the basketball universe. Isaiah Thomas joined us here on the Hangtime podcast. Isaiah, uh, good morning. Everybody's doing well. You know, my daughter tested. Search NBA Hangtime on TuneIn to listen. How do hockey fans know what day it is? Just turn on the Locked on NHL podcast, where a rotating cast of hockey experts guide you through the week with a different theme show for every day. From big news Monday to recap Friday. But we've got a couple of news items that are noteworthy in the NHL in the last week, one of which is below the NHL, and we'll bring that up first. So the AHL announced officially, this has been speculated for weeks and weeks, but the AHL... Search Locked on NHL on TuneIn to listen. To help keep you and your loved ones safe, tune in as the latest guidelines from the CDC. Indoor gatherings, wash your hands and don't touch your face. Stay at least six feet from people you don't live with. Wear a mask. Don't share food, toys, or other items, and avoid shared surfaces. Open windows for better ventilation. Try to avoid gathering indoors as much as possible. For the latest stories and updates on COVID-19, search Coronavirus News on TuneIn. Hi, this is Mike Tirico, introducing you to Sports Uncovered, the newest podcast series from the storytellers at NBC Sports that will shine a fresh light on the most unforgettable moments in sport. The reason why I'm smiling, I might get in trouble for this. Search Sports Uncovered to start listening today. Want to bet football can make you feel nostalgic? Playing days are over, so... On the podcast, NFL Alumni Lounge, Charlie Booth sits down with retired NFL legends to talk about their careers, life after football, and everything in between. Mr. Darren Waller, good to have you. Yes, sir, it's good to be here. Dana White, welcome to the Alumni Lounge. Thanks for having me, brother. Big member of our NFL alumni family, the CEO of the XFL, Mr. Oliver Luck. Charlie, good to see you. Thanks for having me. We're here with the president, Mr. Eric Price. Good to see you. Search NFL Alumni Lounge on TuneIn to listen. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991. To Boston. Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco. Bloomberg 960. To the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe. The Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Markets. Merger Monday is back, this time in the chip space. Analog devices buying Maxim for $21 billion will break down this deal. Plus, Matt Gertkin, geopolitical strategist at BCA Research, he's going to come talk to us about the tensions between President Trump and the Republicans and how it might impact the elections this fall. But first, let's go to Greg Jarrett of Bloomberg News for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Greg. Deeper into the green, Paul, traders are waiting for reports this week from a number of companies that have yet to provide concrete evidence on the impact of the coronavirus. Shares of Pepsi are up after the snack maker reported stronger than expected second quarter sales. Pepsi is up 2.5%. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day here on Bloomberg Radio. S&P is up 1.4%, uh, up 45. The Dow is up 1.7%, up 431. 
And the Nasdaq is up 1.9%, up 202. The 10 year is down 130 seconds, yield 0.64%. West Texas Intermediate Crude is now up a tenth of a percent at 4060 a barrel. Comex Gold is up a half a percent at 1810.20 an ounce. The dollar yen stands at 107.28. The euro, a dollar 13.60. And the British pound, the dollar 26.15. High Crush, a pioneer in the once red-hot frack sand business, has filed for bankruptcy, adding to a growing list of corporate casualties in the downturn of the U.S. shale industry. Chapter 11 petition filed in the Southern District of Texas, listed assets of $500 million to a billion and liabilities in just about the same range. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Bonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. So we have a deal today, analog devices acquiring Maxim Integrated Products, $20.9 billion, a 22% premium to Maxim's closing shares Friday. And it's helping the NASDAQ lead the gains for the indices today. Let's bring somebody in who can tell us all the details about why this deal was done. Wu Jin Ho is Senior Technology Analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Wu, just explain to us, first of all, why analog would want Maxim. Great. Thanks for having me on, Bonnie. So this is all about scale and, and trying to broaden um, analog devices' uh, chip footprint so they can better compete against uh, their larger competitor, uh, Texas Instruments, uh, over the long term. So, uh, actually, Vani, I should probably let you know, the first thing I do when I see an M&A deal in the news, I go to MA Go and I see, I type on there, and I click, click, click on a deal. I want to see who the advisors are, who are the bankers on this deal. And I thought you were going to say sell your stock. <laughs> yes, it was B of A, Merrill Lynch, and Morgan Stanley advising the buyer on the sell side, J.P. Morgan. So, so the big heavyweight investment banks weighing in on this deal. So, Wu, can we look at this deal here. Uh, you talk about its scale. We've heard that before. Give us a sense of kind of how the the semiconductor industry is in terms of consolidation? Is it still a fragmented industry, or are we down to just a handful of heavyweights? Well, I mean, it, it, it is a bifurcated market. So you, you have the heavyweights like Texas Instruments, um, you know, as well as analog devices. Uh, you have microchip. So you, you have these larger players, and then you have a, a bunch of smaller players, specialized chip makers. Um, so to, to some degree, it's still fairly fragmented. Uh, roughly, I, I would say about 40 to 50 percent of the market share goes to these heavyweight players and then fragmented on the, on the other side. Um, and the one thing I will tell you is that, look, this market has been uh, in a phase of consolidation over the last uh, five years or so. Um, you know, it, it took a hiatus for the last couple of years. Now it's finally, it, it seems as if some companies are looking uh, to come back in, in deal making and, and, and the analog devices and Maxim is uh, an example of that. Wu Jin, we have a $275 million cost synergy announcement. It doesn't seem like a lot of cost synergies. Um, am I expecting too much from a merged analog maxim? Sure. So, so I mean, you know, if you look at uh, the scale of, of maxim, uh, there's, there's really not much that you can uh, take out. And if I look at the, the cost synergy opportunities here, it's on the gross margin side and then uh, not much on the operating margin side. So on the gross margin side, you can actually uh, port over some of the chip capacity over to the analog uh, devices, uh, fabs. And then on, on, on the, the operating expense side, um, you know, uh, uh, Maxim has actually done a very good job of streamlining the organization over the last five years. So they they were really uh, running into the bone. There's a little bit that they could take away. But uh, not that much more. But but even then, you are going to still see the overall maximum margins improve to where analog devices is, which is around 41, 42 percent. So, Wooj, talk to us about the end users here of some of the chips that Analog and Maxim puts out. Give us a sense of who their big customers are and what are some of the, the growth drivers for their part of the chip industry. I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, call out any particular big customers, uh, similar to someone like an Intel or an NVIDIA. Uh, if anything, these guys have a portfolio of over 10, uh, you know, 10 to 20,000 chips combined, uh, wow. addressing, you know, uh, you know, 15,000 different customers. It'll go anywhere between Maxim has exposure into your, your Nintendo, uh, uh, your, your, your Nintendo Switch. Uh, Apple has exposure to uh, some uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, analog devices has exposure to some uh, Apple devices. 
automotive, they're, they're very big on automotive, industrial, robotics, they're very big on uh, in, in that sector, and also data center uh, power chips and, and, uh, and uh, uh, converted chips. So uh, they're very broad based from, from a customer and industrial uh, perspective. Now, Wujin, these are two of the biggest semiconductor companies. Well, there are obviously bigger ones, but, uh, you know, analog at $43 billion market cap and, you know, maximum at $18, $19 billion. Who will be next? So we have Infineon, we have NXP, Skyworks. Uh, really, really, really tough to say, Bonnie. Um, you know, I, I didn't think um, the, the matching deal would happen uh, now during, during the pandemic. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, some of the smaller uh, companies, some of these, these smaller niche vendors uh, would come into play. Hmm. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen some headlines where someone like a Cirrus Logic would provide chips to the iPhone uh, or, or Semtech, uh, which, which provides a wireless chip, uh, wireless chips to, the, um, uh, 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 to industrial applications. You know, and, and then there's also, you need to think that we need to have a willing buyer as well. I mean, this is an all-stock deal, uh, which helps preserve analog devices' cash. Uh, the one thing we do have to think about that some of the larger companies uh, may be in cash preservation mode, so right. they won't be able to use their cash as much to uh, consummate a large deal like this. Wu Jin Ho, thanks so much for joining us, helping us break down this deal. Wu Jin Ho is a senior tech analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. He follows uh, all the, t the devices and the, uh, the chip makers uh, out there, so we appreciate his opinion. Bloomberg Television will host Analog Devices CEO Vincent Roche live at 2.40 p.m. Eastern Time today. So we'll get a sense of kind of what was really driving this deal from the buyer CEO here. Get a sense of the strategy and, and kind of the outlook for these combined companies going forward. So 2.40 Eastern Time today on Bloomberg Television. That'll be a must watch. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. for Nathan Hager in World and National Headlines. Well, Paul, we're watching the latest coronavirus numbers. And Arizona just reported a 1.1% increase in new infections. That's the lowest in two weeks state also added eight deaths to its tally. Florida's case count jumped another 4.7 percent today. That was above the seven-day average, but below a record high set yesterday. Miami Mayor Francis Suarez says it's too soon to say whether his city's schools will open with in-person classes this fall. The education commissioner of the state of Florida has mandated that schools be open, but I'm not sure that our superintendent is, is uh, in agreement with that. And certainly, um, you know, not if it poses a risk to our children or to, the, or to the parents who are teaching. In an interview with Fox News, White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow said President Trump may be willing to consider more state and local government aid if schools reopen. State and local aid will be top of mind as Congress returns from its recess and gets back to work on the next stimulus round. Bloomberg's Irv Chapman reports from Washington. Governors and mayors will again be pressing Congress to make up for the hit their budgets are taking. Maryland's Larry Hogan chairs the National Governors Association. It's critically important. We've already lost 1.5 million state and local government workers. It's anticipated we could lose as many as 4 million more. Frontline health care workers and teachers and police and firefighters. And we're as impacted as our businesses. We're expecting a decrease in revenues to state governments of up to 30 percent. Governor Hogan said in a Bloomberg interview he's a Republican, a conservative, and a small Small business entrepreneur, and we can't afford not to spend the money. In Washington, Irv Chapman, Bloomberg Radio. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. The following is a message from P. Jim. Welcome to Out Sea in 60, perspectives from P. Jim thought leaders. Here's Mark Barabo, the head of global equity at Jenison Associates. You're looking at bigger implications of technology playing a role in keeping us all connected, giving us access to information or goods very quickly. So we don't see any of those trends changing. In fact, they're likely to accelerate. There's some new things that have come along, though, that people might find useful, like telemedicine. There were skeptics about that, and I think the more people using it, especially the more doctors are using it today, uh, the more they're liking it. Uh, you can see more patients. It can be more effective. It might actually be a better solution. Hear more PGM perspectives at PGM.com. That's PGIM.com. Partner with PGM, the investment management business of Prudential. These statements are not intended to be investment advice. 
and should not be used as the basis for any investment decision. What's the true value of your custodial relationship? Ben Harrison of BNY Mellon's Pershing explains. As sophisticated investors demand more from their advisors, advisory firms in turn need to rely on their custodian to help them grow their complex businesses. At BNY Mellon's Pershing, supporting the rapid growth of RIAs is our number one priority. We understand what it means to deliver true value to our clients who are looking for a custodian that is aligned with their best interest and delivers high value solutions, all in an open architecture environment with flexibility, choice, and transparency. Learn why so many of the largest advisory firms turn to us for the financial strength, resiliency, and high-touch service that BNY Mellon Pershing provides. When you work with Pershing, we put your business first. Can your custodian say that? Learn more at Pershing.com or call 800-445-4467. Pershing Advisor Solutions, LLC. Member FINRA. Eurotunnel Le Chateau is a safer way to get to France and beyond with social distancing built in. There's no scrum at security, hanging around for your bags or shouldering strangers in your seat. With Eurotunnel Le Chateau, simply drive on at Folkestone and stay in your car comfortably. Then drive off 35 minutes later. Stay safe. Go Tunnel. Eurotunnel Le Chateau. A safer way to France and beyond. Listening has always taught us a lot at Honda. And lately, we've been listening to your thumbs. Because thumbs can do everything now. The world is at their thumb tips. So now, the My Honda Plus app lets the thumb take control for your car too. Even when you're not inside the new Honda E, your thumb can find where you parked, set the temperature before you get in, check how much the battery is charged, and schedule charging for when electricity is cheapest. The new Honda E and My Honda Plus app. Oh, a thumbs up. Honda, the power of dreams. Word of hockey and pop culture coexist. Let me get this straight. You would be able to name more people nostalgically than currently? This doesn't Come on. You're so crazy. I know, I know. <laughs> Other podcast, Puck Soup, <laughs> NHL analyst Greg Wyshynski, Sean McAdoo, and Ryan Lambert chase the conversational biscuit up and down the ice, skating between serious discussion on what's happening in pro hockey to irreverent opinions on movies, fast food, and life in general. Search Puck Soup on TuneIn to listen. To help keep you and your loved ones safe, Tune in as the latest guidelines from the CDC. Home alone or with housemates, stay home as much as possible. Try to allow only people you live with into your home. Wash your hands. If you're sick, stay home and isolate from housemates. For the latest stories and updates on COVID-19, search Coronavirus News on TuneIn. Times Radio, an exciting new national speech station, is here. Featuring live news, analysis, conversation, and the unequivocal world-beating journalism of The Times. Join Asma Mir and me, Stig Abel. I'm John Pienaar. Join me on Times Radio. Join me, Mariella Frostrup. I'm Giles Corrin. Hello, I'm Kathy Newman. This is Michael Portillo. Join me, Carol Walker. I'm Hugo Rifkin. Times Radio is here. Search Times Radio on TuneIn to listen. How do you keep track of all your favorite stations and podcasts? Easy. You add them to your favorites list. Just find the audio you want to bookmark and tap the heart icon. Then, whenever you want to browse your favorites, you'll find everything under the favorites tab. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Who says you can't have a laugh while getting serious about America's pastime? <laughs> on the daily podcast Locked On MLB, comedian and baseball fanatic Paul Francis Sullivan talks about each team, each pennant race, and everything else in the game from rule changes and controversies to baseball cards and stadium food. For those of you who are not familiar with me or the old show, I love to obsess over baseball. I'm talking baseball over the Super Bowl. We had a TV show in the Division Series during my wedding. Search Locked On MLB on TuneIn to listen today. First, we're told that masks don't work. Then, we're told to wear them all the time. One week, we hear that the mortality rate is 2%. The next... 
Well, who knows? In the time of COVID-19, there is so much uncertainty and so much scientists are learning in real time along with the rest of the world. So it's hard to know what you can be sure of and what's still a big question mark. Enter Podcast 19 from 538, where we'll explore the evidence behind the science in our fight against coronavirus. I'm science journalist Anna Rothschild. Each week, I'll investigate coronavirus mysteries, keep track of the latest developments on vaccines and treatments. Oh, and I'll try to edit out all the times I shush my family since I'm recording this thing from the chaos of my home. Search Podcast 19 to listen today. Hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Stocks jump up and touch a five-week high on expectations. Earnings will offer an optimistic outlook for the U.S. economy amid a raging pandemic. Oil erased an earlier loss. Why don't we take a look at those numbers as we do every 15 minutes? S&P's up one and a quarter percent, up 40. Dow's up one and a half percent, up 384. And the Nasdaq is up 1.7 percent, up 177. The 10 year is down 132nd. The yield is 0.64 percent. West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil is down three tenths of a percent at 40.41 a barrel, while Comex Gold's up four tenths of a percent at 1809.40 an ounce. The dollar yen 107.25. The euro a dollar 13.65, and the British pound a dollar 26.15. Tesla's relentless surge has continued today amid several upcoming events that include the possible unveiling of a new battery technology from the vehicle maker, entry into a lucrative new market, and the potential inclusion of the stock into the prestigious S&P 500. Tesla is up 12.5%. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Vonnie Quinn and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Well, the responses to the economic fallout of this pandemic have been swift and uh, severe here in the United States. First, we had the Federal Reserve really step in and inject a tremendous amount of liquidity uh, into the marketplace. We've had uh, three rounds of fiscal stimulus coming out of Congress, capped by round three a couple months ago, totaling $3 trillion. Uh, now pressure is building on a fourth round to come out of Washington, and that is less clear uh, what will be in that and the size and, and the timing and so on. So to get an update here, what it means in the world of Washington and for our broader economy. We welcome Matt Gertkin, geopolitical strategist for BCA Research based in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Matt. Let's just start off there. Fiscal stimulus round number four. What do you expect? When do you expect it? Hey, thanks for having me on. Well, I would expect something upward of two trillion U.S. dollars, and by the time wow. the Senate goes for recess on August tenth. The, anything much less than that, anything much less than what the House Democrats have passed at $3 trillion, uh, risks forcing the U.S. fiscal thrust to pull back. And that's not something a president running for re-election would want to have happen. What makes you think it'll be $2 trillion? We're seeing $1 trillion for the next round. And uh, it does strike me that there will have to be some kind of accommodation made in Congress. Yeah, right now the Senate GOP, and actually for several months, has been saying $1 trillion. Uh, President Trump and some members of his administration have said $2 trillion, but most recently Mike Pence and one of his aides implied that maybe he's on the $1 trillion side. And then the Democrats, as I mentioned, were pushing for a $3 trillion bill. So Trump's in the middle, but as I say, he's got an election to fight, and he's a big spender anyway. He's been fiscally profligate, so I think he'll end up on the big end of this uh, siding with the Democrats. And then I think that the GOP senators are going to have to just get with the program because if they don't, They'll suffer if Trump suffers. So, Matt, we're, we're getting closer and closer to uh, that fall election, which strangely uh, has been on the back burner here as, as everyone is focused on the pandemic. What's kind of the thinking in your world as to what perhaps a Biden presidency might mean? Uh, what are some of the, your big takeaways that you're looking at right now? Yeah, well, the big change that has happened is that the United States is doing this massive uh, stimulus, And so if, if I'm anywhere close to correct on that stimulus, we could end up with something of 6% of global GOP, GDP being U.S. fiscal stimulus. Uh, we're looking at the U.S. maybe putting in 20% of its own GDP in, in stimulus. Wow. So that's a massive turn, and that's going to power a cyclical rebound, as we've seen. And over the long run, that should be the decisive factor, kind of regardless of who wins the election. 
Uh, but a Biden administration clearly is going to have a major regulatory shock, reversing the deregulation that Trump did. And that's even if he doesn't win the Senate. In truth, he's very likely to win the Senate for the Democrats if he does win the White House. And then in that case, uh, you could have, I think, an extraordinary windfall of, of, a, of a shift to the left in terms of uh, health care, in terms of immigration, in terms of even the tech sector facing a little bit more scrutiny. And then, of course, you also have uh, you have the, the cyclical reflationary impacts there of spending more and giving more for people in wages and household uh, spending. But then you have this headwind for corporates that have to worry more about taxes and regulations. The only clues we have as to the type of campaign that he's he's you know, running or the type of presidency that he would he would um, lead, though, Matt, is the people that he's already appointed to a, a potential transition team. We're not really seeing a whole lot of economic messaging. How, where is your evidence to suggest that there be a hard turn left? Yeah, Biden is a centrist, and that's how he won the nomination. He's a, he's a center-left establishment politician, no question about that. Uh, but remember that the way that you try to predict the outlook for things like this is not by wildly guessing based on a president's preferences. I mean, President Trump had a preference of a 45 percent tariff on all Chinese imports, but he didn't get that. The issue is that the winner of the White House is likely to bring the Senate with them. And when the Senate goes Democratic and you get a full blue sweep, uh, which is certainly what looks likely today if the election were held today, well, in that environment, the constraint on the Democratic Party is removed. Uh, Biden will be pressured by his party to take advantage of a historic situation. And that's, remember, similar to when the Obama administration came in. But there's a lot of frustration in the party that there was too much of an attempt to be bipartisan under the Obama administration so that this is a crisis that really can't go to waste this time around. And I think that's how the party is going to play things. So the filibuster, for instance, is very much at risk in the Senate. So, Matt, given that the, the Senate, the Republicans in the Senate are at risk here, are you surprised they haven't broken ranks with President Trump? Well, I think in some ways they have. I mean, I think in the news flow over the past several months, you've seen a lot more flaking off from the senators than you had at any previous time in Trump's administration. And that's because the administration is just fundamentally weakened and embattled by a global pandemic and a recession, uh, Trump's handling of those issues. Uh, so I, I do see some uh, some wobbling uh, within the Senate ranks, but also, of course, you, you're seeing the real divisions that always existed between the establishment Republicans who might want to be more fiscally hawkish and President Trump, who's just a big spending populist and wants, especially in this case, to make sure that he gives the economy a jolt ahead of the election. And that may even be behind that little difference between, you know, Trump implying that he wants to go even bigger than the Democrats on stimulus while uh, Mike Pence's office is maybe implying he wants to be more where Mitch McConnell is at $1 trillion. Matt, what can we expect to hear from Biden next? I mean, we, we haven't heard all that much. I guess there's not, a, there's not a whole lot of advantage to him being out there and, uh, you know, making a lot of public statements. But when, when will he start? Well, in August, you know, we, obviously the virus is throwing everyone for a loop on timing. But in August, you're supposed to have the party conventions. And the party convention is a time where he will complete this process we've seen in recent months of him touching every base in the Democratic Party and its constituencies to show everyone and, and across the nation that he's allied with the progressives, that he's allied with the different voting groups. Um, and, and ultimately, he's going to want President Barack Obama's backing and other top Democrats backing. Uh, so I think he's going to have to start getting out more uh, later in, uh, in August. Uh, but in the meantime, he is perfectly happy to kind of hide away in his basement or wherever he is and let President Trump attract the attention uh, with often his c controversial or unorthodox statements and, and take the heat. Well, yes, indeed. Matt, thank you. So interesting to speak with you. And, and indeed, as you say, August, yep. it seems quite <laughs> late. It's very close to an election. It must be one of the few times that you really have only had a competitor sort of emerge properly a couple of months before. I mean, there was there was a little time back where he was he was out there, but uh, he was pulled back in quite I think it's quickly. a strategy. Just I think it the is, the too. It's nothing but bad news out there. Why yeah. get in that news cycle? Exactly. Matt Gertkin is geopolitical strategist at BCA Research. He joined us there from Montreal in Canada. 
So that's, uh, that'll do it for this two hours of markets, but do stay tuned. We're following the markets throughout the day here on Bloomberg Radio. Indices now up one and a quarter percent plus, in fact. In addition to Bloomberg Radio, you can catch the latest news and biggest newsmakers on Bloomberg Television. Look for us on Direct TV Channel 353 or check your... Eurotunnel Le Shuttle is a safer way to get to France and beyond with social distancing built in. There's no scrum at security, hanging around for your bags or shouldering strangers in your seat. With Eurotunnel Le Shuttle, simply drive on at Folkestone and stay in your car comfortably. Then drive off 35 minutes later. Stay safe. Go Tunnel, Eurotunnel Le Shuttle, a safer way to France and beyond. Vision Express stores are open again for all your eye care needs. So you can now book an eye test. And while we look after your eyes, we're looking out for your safety too by following social distancing measures and using personal protective equipment. Find your nearest store and book online at visionexpress.com. We're open for you. Heroes. They're the ones we turn to in our darkest hour. Like when you blow a fuse and the lights go off. From electrics to heating, plumbing to plastering, at Local Heroes, every job completed by an expert tradesperson comes with a 12-month British gas guarantee when you pay online. So if it needs fixing, there's a Local Hero for that. To get a quote, search Local Heroes. Terms and conditions apply. To help keep you and your loved ones safe, tune in as the latest guidelines from the CDC. Outdoor activities? Wash your hands and don't touch your face. Stay at least six feet from people you don't live with. Wear a mask. Avoid shared surfaces like swings or benches. For the latest stories and updates on COVID-19, search Coronavirus News on TuneIn. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We'll start again today with the markets, really on the upswing, I must say. Abigail Doolittle is here to explain what's going on. Boy, we're off to a, a fresh start this week, Abigail. Abigail? Abigail Doolittle. Okay, we're going to keep trying to get out of it because we do want to hear about what's going on in the markets. But in the meantime, down in Washington, it may be a hot July, but things are not cooling down in Washington one bit because they've got the U.S.-China trade sanctions going back and forth. They've got to negotiate a fourth round of stimulus, uh, a fiscal package. And, oh, by the way, there is a presidential election going on. To take us through it all, we can go now to Isaac Boltanski. He is policy director research uh, at Compass Point. So, Isaac, welcome. It's good to be here. So there's this back and forth, tit for tat sort of U.S.-China sanctions. But it does strike me that... One thing maybe there is bipartisan agreement on in Washington right now is we don't like China very much. There isn't much agreement that we have down here, but but that is undeniably top of the list. And I think what we've seen over the past few weeks is both parties coalescing around the idea that it is necessary and in the vital national interest to become uh, uh, more aligned when it comes to our policy with China. And it's not just here, David. It's also uh, our partners around the globe. I think that the EU has been more serious regarding this matter in particular. Now, we've had some developments in terms of Congress passing very limited sanctions and then China responding uh, just over the past day. But I think it's important to note here, David, that thus far, the back and forth between China and the United States has been measured, proportional, and largely symbolic. My call is that we will continue to have these back and forths and maybe a degree of headline volatility, but there's really no reason to believe that leaders on either side of the Pacific want to see a massive unwind of the relationship in the near term as they're battling with issues domestically. 
And, and as, as you say, uh, there's been back and forth in the last day or so. There's also been back and forth between the former Vice President Joe Biden and President Trump over economic plans. And as I say, Joe Biden doesn't seem to be a big fan of China. But I wonder in the new election that we're having this fall, is anyone going to stand up for free ta trade? Because another point of apparent agreement is neither side seems to be saying, let's have free trade. So to, to your point, Former Vice President Biden came out with what was dubbed a unity uh, task force document last week and offered his first economic overview accordingly. And I think what was striking to me, David, um, there were two main points. Number one, it seems as though the former vice president agrees with President Trump regarding China. There was harsh language in these documents regarding our relationship with China. It seems as though the only real difference is tactically. Biden appears to want to push China multilaterally with our trading partners, whereas President Trump has shown a willingness to go it alone on that front. Now, more broadly, I think this is something that when we step back, it's almost mind-numbing to think about. But now both major party candidates for the presidency of the United States are supporting significantly as centerpieces of their economic policy, manufacturing onshoring. Uh, this is a big shift. And to me, this is uh, the most important component of this election in that um, one way or the other, we're going to see how this U.S. Congress and the White House can bring uh, manufacturing back because the visions are similar in that they're both full of economic nationalism, but there are differences. Uh, there also are differences on things like taxation, because it's clear that Joe Biden, if he became president, would want more taxation. And let's be frank, he might have more leeway to get that done if, in fact, the Senate goes Democrat. But at the same time, Biden would go as far as perhaps some on the left wing of his party would like him to. Yeah, I'm struck, David, because just a few months ago, I believe that the Trump White House thought that they would be running with an economic tailwind at their back and uh, campaigning against the modern day Che Guevara. But instead, what you have is uh, the economic troubles from uh, the coronavirus, but also um, a far more centrist candidate than I think the White House expected just a few months ago. Joe Biden, through this unity task force, has moved to the left on certain items. And I can tick off a plethora of areas where um, his new policy position is slightly more progressive than uh, his original campaign staff, uh, status. But David, by and large, he rejected the big ticket items like Medicare for all, like the Green New Deal, like uh, legalization of recreational cannabis and a national fracking ban. It really seems that they did everything they could to thread the needle whereby they assuage the progressive wing as much as possible without spooking centrist and moderate voters. So, Isaac, that's November. Right here in July, we've got some issues about keeping the economy going and whether we're going to hit some sort of a cliff, particularly with respect to unemployment insurance. Where does that stand right now? And from your perspective, is this a matter of if it gets done or when? And maybe as important, who's going to get to claim credit for getting something done this month? So let's start with, with the high level. I am as confident as you can be about anything in this political climate that there will be a phase four deal of over a trillion dollars in fiscal uh, support signed into law by early August. We have miles yet to go, and I think you know there will be a fair amount of political posturing and kabuki theater between here and the actual bill signing, uh, but I am confident that it will get done. Both parties are incredibly incentivized to secure certain items that matter to them. Democrats want state and local funding as well as an extension of the supplementary unemployment insurance payment. Republicans want business liability protection uh, and repurposing of the PPP funds. There's something that brings everyone to the table, David. So we will get a deal done. I am as confident as can be. As for credit, I think that both sides are going to take credit. I think that ultimately it is positive for President Trump because any market positive news and developments benefit the incumbent. 
Yeah, no question about it. Although he's got a lot of problems he's going to have to overcome with the coronavirus and the economy if it keeps going the way it is right now. Thank you so much, Isaac. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. That's Isaac Opoltansky. He is Director of Policy Research at Compass Point. In the meantime, even as we speak, our colleague Francine Lacqua is holding a webinar with Andrew Bailey. She, he's the governor of the Bank of England, as well as John Williams, the president of the New York Fed, about LIBOR and other subjects. Let's listen in on part of what they're talking about. The um, sterling market. Yeah, there's a lot of work that the industry's been doing on uh, conventions, both uh, loan conventions and cash spread adjustments, as well as um, uh, standardized loan docs. Um, that work is, is fairly advanced, and we should be in a position through the working group to, to publish those papers um, in a relatively short time frame. Great. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, Dimitri Lamasson asking, what regulatory tools and approaches are being considered for those portfolios which cannot be transitioned by end to 2021? Is consideration, so this is, you know, A, applying higher capital charges, providing strict product set guidelines? Yes, that, those are the two. Uh, Governor Bailey? Well, two things. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, our supervisors uh, are now, you know, in close touch with, you know, particularly, particularly the banking sector, uh, to ensure that the, you know, each institution is now planning and executing the transition. And going back to what I said earlier, the whole aim of this, is, is, as John was saying, is to narrow down the, the legacy through those actions. Uh, and that involves, obviously, concrete actions on instruments, but also it involves, obviously, sort of a you know, program of, of, of information and education. And only then when we get, and that's, that's the aim of sort of supervision and regulation supporting the industry, we then turned our mind to, sort of in the UK, to what, what will we do with the, the, the sort of the absolutely irreducible legacy where people come to us and say, look, I'm, yeah, I just can't deal with it because it's been, it's been structured in such a way that, you know, the, 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 the key was thrown away when the contract was, was locked up. And that's where the legislation is. But let me just say on the legislation, it's, it's UK legislation, works in a, in, a, in a UK context, but we cannot say, and it, 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 it isn't designed, it won't work in every part of the world because you know, it, it obviously isn't designed for that. I mean, the, the, the legislative writ doesn't run all the way. So I, I want to say to people, please don't again think this is the, this is the magic solution and you can sit tight and, uh, and wait for it to come along. I have a, does anybody else want to come in on that? Otherwise, I have many questions to get to. Um, another one for, for you, Governor, I think. How likely do you feel that the FCA and BOE could make the LIBOR non-representative announcement at the end of 2020? And does the FCA and BOE prefer to make announcements for different currency LIBORs at different times? Well, it's a for the FCA, which I'm no longer chief executive of. Um, but I think the FCA will, you know, will make that judgment when they feel it's appropriate. It's not been done before because the benchmark regulation, obviously, is, is, is still relatively new. Um, I, you know, my understanding is that the FCA will, therefore, you know, set out the, at some appropriate moment the criteria uh, that, that, that should be used. But I, I don't think I think it's wise at this point not to put a date on it. Alexandro Popescu from Societe Generale. A live webinar being conducted right now with Andrew Bailey. He's a governor of the Bank of England as well as John Williams, president of the New York Fed. You can continue to listen to this if you want on Live Go on your Bloomberg terminal. In the meantime, coming up here, we're going to talk with Dr. Stephen Corwin. He is the head of New York Hospital Center, New York Presbyterian Hospital Center, about the fight against the coronavirus. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. It's the people with it. Imagine winning 10 grand. Yes! With Set for Life, you can win 10 grand every month for 30 years. Get in! Amazing! Woo! Yes! Sweet! Unbelievable! Woo! Set for Life from the National Lottery. Your numbers make amazing happen. Play Monday online or on the app. Prize may be capped. Rules, procedures, and game specific rules apply. Players must be 16 or over. Here's to you that learned with homeschooling that your kids are smarter than you. Here's to all the self taught banana bread bakers. 
And to you, that rocked that very questionable homemade haircut. Costa is giving three pounds to everyone that missed us as much as we missed you. Get your three pounds in the Costa app today and enjoy a coffee, cake, or snack on us. Come on, you earned it. Terms and conditions apply. For details, visit costa.co.uk forward slash terms. And action. I was offered one. Cut. That's not on the script. I was offered one. Get you. Ladies and gentlemen, I was offered one. Come, boy. I was offered one. Don't say can't work for it. Nine out of ten people said they were offered a great value deal with O2. Get yours today, in-store, online, or by phone. I was offered one, too. O2 Retail Exit Survey 309 of 348 agreed with the statement. O2 offered me a great value deal. For full verification, see o2.co.uk forward slash terms. London. Toolstation are here to help get your job safely started and finished. With over 60 branches within the M25. All open with social distancing and contactless click and collect from five minutes. And with 20,000 top trade quality products to choose from. Order online now for collection in London branches and get £5 off when you spend over £30 with the code LON530. So, get your job started at toolstation.com. Terms and conditions apply. Short on time? Don't worry. You can still get your cook on with Asda. Get three Asda ready meals for just £5.50. Like our beef lasagna or our tomato and mozzarella panette bake. Hang up your oven gloves, we've got dinner covered. Asda. Save money, live better. Selected stores and lines subject to availability. Meals 400 grams, two pence ten each. Get ready for the University of Bedfordshire. We've got all you need to make ambition become reality. To make lifelong friendships. To make contacts in your chosen industry. To make a name for yourself. To make it. In fact, we've got everything except your application. So get it in, sit back, and relax. Wait, actually, check out our generous scholarships and bursaries for support at every step at beds.ac.uk. Okay, now you can relax. False information about coronavirus is being spread everywhere. Popping up here, being shared there. Bing! Reaching and tricking more people with every share. They don't even understand the harm. It can cause. False information can be hard to spot. Make sure you know what you're sharing. Don't feed the beast. Visit sharechecklist.gov.uk. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. This isn't just music, it's a feeling. The feeling of being out on the road with the sun on your face and the wind in your hair. And because the AA are always ready to get you back on the road, there's no need for that feeling to stop. The AA. Join today. Give yourself a Diet Coke break. Tuesdays at KFC gonna get you like, wow, pow, chow, kapow, get down right now. If you know how, then take a bow. Because this deal's gonna raise a brow. Get nine pieces of original recipe chicken for an eye-popping $5.99. What the? (laughs) Every Tuesday at KFC. Participating restaurants ends 18th of August 2020. Tuesdays only subject to availability, not available online. With the shift to remote working, video conferencing has become the new normal to keep your business running. But is it reliable and secure? Cisco WebEx is committed to the highest security standards and already trusted by both small businesses and many of the world's largest organizations. Call, message, and meet securely with Cisco WebEx. Sign up at cisco.uk slash work from home. When secure remote work is critical, WebEx is essential. Vision Express stores are open again for all your eye care needs. So you can now book an eye test. And while we look after your eyes, we're looking out for your safety too by following social distancing measures and using personal protective equipment. Find your nearest store and book online at visionexpress.com. We're open for you. Wondering what to play next? Want to know what other TuneIn listeners are listening to right now? Head to the trending section under Browse to explore the most popular stations and podcasts on TuneIn today. Millions of listeners like you can't be wrong. Mark Crumpton, David. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much to Mark Crumpton. We're going to turn now to the coronavirus. Uh, New York has made great progress in fighting the coronavirus with no deaths reported on Sunday. It's the first time that's happened since the crisis began. But at the same time, other states now are on the front lines. And we welcome Dr. Stephen Corwin. He is the president and CEO of the New York Presbyterian Hospital. That is one of the most premier hospital centers in the country. Doctor, thank you so much for being with us. Explain to us what has happened here. New York is doing, it appears at the moment, really well. Other st states are not. Where does where's the difference come from? Well, we had our peak, as you know, in the March-April time frame and then struggled mightily at that point uh, and then have come down substantially since. Now we're seeing the wave uh, move across the country. Others that were not as severely affected are now getting severely affected. Some of that is, unfortunately, some premature reopening, some ill-conceived reopenings like bars, uh, a lot of indoor dining. And some of that is just the natural history of what this virus is going to do. So we're not complacent at all here in New York. We realize that this could rebound on us uh, in a tragic way. So we're extremely nervous and disheartened by what's happening in the rest of the country. Yeah, we don't wish ill on any state, goodness knows, in the country. But I've seen sure. it said some places that the mistake is you can't just keep people shut in until the, the curve flattens. You have to really bring it down a fair amount. Is that right? Yeah, you want to see you want to see with a lot of testing that you're testing at a rate of anywhere uh, under three or four percent, two percent, one percent positivity. Once you start seeing positivity with widespread testing uh, in the ten plus percent range, and we've seen ranges now in the twenty two percent, twenty five percent range, you have widespread community spread. You can't contact trace under those circumstances, uh, and. You can't avoid the spread of the virus, and that's the problem. You can't quell it. So we may have flattened some in some of the other states, but not sufficiently. And then in the absence of a widespread testing regime, you get into a circumstance where you get community spread, and then all bets are off. Well, what about the testing system here in the country? Because as you said, I've seen rates certainly well over 10 percent, which seems to be the magic number here to make sure that we're yes. really doing what we need to do with testing. And yet we see those long lines in places. Also, I've heard there are problems because of the delay in the results, because even if you're testing, if it takes you a week to get the results back, you can't contact trace. Exactly. So I think you have a couple of different problems. The first is uh, unless you have a low number of infections in the environment, you can't appropriately contact trace. If you're getting 10,000 cases in a state per day, there's no way you can contact trace. That's problem one. Problem two is you can't wait three or four days to get a test result back. Uh, and that and we're now seeing in terms of some of the testing uh, being uh, outsourced, if you will. The third problem you have uh, with testing is, although we've tested a lot more than we did early on, we still are not testing frequently enough or adequately enough in all of our states. So that combination of problems really hampers our ability to curtail this virus. Given what's going on in other states like Florida, Arizona, California, Texas, is it inevitable that we're going to have something of a spike back in the New York area? We talked with Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey last week, and he said the one thing he hadn't really anticipated is some of the problems with other states and people coming back into his state. We've, or, we've always anticipated that we would get a second wave in terms of the way our hospital is functioning. So, for example, David, we started out the pandemic with about 450 ICU beds. Our baseline now will be over 600 ICU beds. We have to presume it's going to come back. Look, until we have a vaccine or an effective treatment or the combination thereof, we're living with this virus. We do not have herd immunity. We're far from getting herd immunity. And so you're in a situation where you're titrating opening versus infections. The more you open, the higher the risk of infection. If there's a lot of infection in the country, it's bound to uh, uh, cross barriers. And it doesn't matter what zip code you're in, it's going to come, come and hurt you. Dr. Corwin, talk about the treatment. I mean, the, vi the vaccine we all are hoping for, it comes when it comes. We've heard there are more effective treatments like remdesivir and things like pronation, things like that. Is there a danger there that's communicating to the populace, you know what, you don't have to worry about it quite so much because we're so much better at the treatment? There's a big danger there, David. We do not have an effective treatment. Remdesivir has got some effect. Uh, steroids, dexamethasone, uh, in later stages of the disease may uh, confer a survival benefit. Uh, improvements in the way we do supportive care 
Uh, but let me just give you a stark statistic. In our pandemic experience, 20% of patients hospitalized die. That's an enormous number of deaths. In our most advanced heart surgeries, we usually have anywhere from a five to 10% mortality. So 20% mortality in a disease where you get hospitalized is nothing to sneeze at. We've also got to recognize that as a society, we have to prevent harm from happening to others. So I'm very mindful of the fact that people want to have their liberty, but you shouldn't have the liberty to infect somebody else. And we have to wear masks. There's just no question about it. We've got to discipline ourselves to do that. And there may be activities we just can't do, like hanging around in bars and things of that nature. And by the way, uh, you may have less of a mortality if you're in your 20s or 30s, but you can still die from this. There's just no question about it. You may not be able to hang around at bars. Can you send your kids to school? That's certainly a very big that's issue right be a now. Very, Are there circumstances in which we could do that? It's going to be very tricky. Very tricky. First, you want to get your, your rate in the community way down. Uh, which uh, which a lot of our states do not have, particularly Florida, Texas. Uh, this, the second is you want to be able to protect your teachers and you want to be able to protect the kids. There is so much we do not know about this disease. You know, people said, well, when the warm weather comes, it's going to go away. Hope is not a strategy. You can hope it's going to go away, but it's, it's, it's not gone away. So there's a lot we don't know. We now know that there are asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spreaders. Uh, kids can get sick with this, but kids can also spread it. We also have to be concerned about uh, our teachers. So there's a lot that goes into this. A hybrid model with less kids in class, a lot of disinfection, wearing masks, being able to contact trace if a child gets ill is critical. And as I said before, David, you cannot contact trace if you have 10 or 11 or 12,000 infections in, uh, every day in a state. It's not possible. Uh, this may be uh, outside of your ken, but how do you balance the, the, the health effects on children staying at home? Because there are some risks there as well, particularly in an urban setting. It's very, very tough. Uh, and it is beyond my ken. And I can tell you, uh, we struggled mightily in New York about closing the New York City school system. Number one, you want children to be educated. Number two, many children relied on the school system for, uh, for food, food stability. Number three, Parents who have to work, who can't take off from work, uh, rely on the school system for their children to be able to go to it. So it's a, it, is, it is a very, very difficult decision. What I would say, though, is until the virus is low enough in the community, it's hard to contemplate opening schools in any substantive way. Okay, doctor, really appreciate you being with us. As always, that's Dr. Stephen Corwin. He is the president and CEO of the New York Hospi Presbyterian Hospital Center. And now we want to go to stock of the hour, which will remain on the subject of coronavirus because it's Pfizer, and it's Pfizer because they have two candidates for a vaccine that are fast-tracked by the FDA. We go now to Scarlett Fu for a report. Hi there, David. That's right. Pfizer is the best performer in the Dow Industrials on that COVID-19 vaccine hope. And, of course, its German partner, BioNTech, uh, is seeing its ADR surge as well to a four-month high. Now, when you talk about the different treatments that, bio, uh, that Pfizer and BioNTech have available, two of those treatments have gotten fast-track designation, basically priority status based on preliminary data from their phase one and phase two studies that are currently still pending. Both these treatments use the messenger RNA technology to mimic the virus. The phase three vaccine uh, trials, I should say, are due to start later this month with about 30,000 patients. Now, in addition to the fast-track designation, both Pfizer and BioNTech did get some money last week as well from the government, about $250 million for R&D under the White House's Operation Warp Speed program to develop a vaccine. Uh, we know there's a lot of competition out there to find a vaccine, and in terms of market opportunities, uh, for that vaccine, I was looking at some research from Bloomberg Intelligence to take a look at what a successful vaccine would be worth. Assuming 100% clinical success, and of course that's a huge assumption, and 50-50 profit sharing, a vaccine could be worth between $6 billion and almost $11 billion, reaching the upper band of that value if there's annual vaccinations required. Of course, it all depends on pricing strategy as well, because one thing to keep in mind 
is that large pharmaceutical companies like Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca have all announced plans to sell any COVID-19 vaccine at cost. We haven't necessarily heard Pfizer identify any of that yet, but it's something to keep in mind here as we look at uh, how vaccine currently makes up 13% of its revenue. Um, one of the smaller slices of the pie when you consider that legacy medicines, internal medicine, oncology are a bigger part of its top line. David? It's fascinating. So I'll just quickly here at the end, does the fact that the FDA is fast-tracking to say anything about what, whether the, vi the vaccine is going to work, or is it just if they make it past phase three, then they can go fast? I think it's the latter. Uh, it doesn't indicate necessarily a success in the clinical trials. It's just there's reason for optimism, and there's reason to continue pushing ahead with uh, more of progress on that front, and we'll see how it all shakes out. David? Yeah, good, goodness knows we're all rooting for them. Thank you so much to Scott Fu for that report on Pfizer. And coming up here, we're going to talk with Laura Brown. She is from George Washington University, and she's really a student of presidential history. We're going to talk about the difference between President Trump and Vice President Biden as they run for the presidency come this November. That's coming up next with Laura Brown from George Washington. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. U.S. stocks are posting gains on Wall Street. The Dow was up 404 points. NASDAQ up 186. S&P 500 climbing 42. Pfizer is leading the Dow higher after the FDA gave two of its COVID-19 vaccine candidates fast-track status. But demand is also climbing for what Wall Street sees as safer bets as the virus spreads. Amazon, Apple, and Netflix are at new highs. Shares of Pepsi are up after reporting a stronger-than-expected spring quarter as people stocked up on snack foods and soft drinks. And it's one of the largest merger deals of the year, and it's taking place in the semiconductor industry. Analog Devices is buying Maxim Integrated Products for $21 billion. Companies are talking merger again after a break of several months due to the coronavirus pandemic. Donna Wilson, Bloomberg Radio. For the Jewish Communal Fund, Noel Spiegel, former senior partner with Deloitte & Touche and past JCF president, discusses the advantages of a donor-advised fund over a private foundation. There's a lot involved in having a private foundation. You need to engage attorneys, you need to engage accountants, file tax returns. At JCF, all of that is done for you. You don't have to get involved in anything other than making your contribution to your fund and then determining which grants that you want to make. A JCF fund may be opened with a minimum $5,000 contribution of cash or appreciated securities and can be used as an alternative to or together with a private foundation. If you have a foundation, you have to list all of the contributions that you made. Potentially, anybody, because the information is public, can find out exactly which organizations a foundation has made charitable contributions to. Let JCF simplify your philanthropy and protect your privacy. Learn more about JCF's private client group at jcfny.org. The possibility of lung cancer can be pretty scary, especially if you're one of approximately 8 million current or former smokers at high risk. That's why SaveByTheScan.org wants you to know that now there's a breakthrough low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early, and it only takes 60 seconds. You stop smoking, now start screening. For an easy quiz to see if you're eligible, visit SaveByTheScan.org. It could save your life. SaveByTheScan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative and the Ad Council. How long will it take for the economy to recover? How many of them have remained on the job throughout this? People are not going to be in public transportation. Nobody knows. You have received £600 million in the UK. But we can promise the most complete information and the most detailed analysis. The question is, what kind of recovery will it be? Through every twist and turn. Would you be wary of investment in China at this point? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It is time now for First Word News, and for that we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said today it's important to wear face coverings in confined spaces such as shops. He added that the government would be making an announcement in the coming days on whether they should be mandatory in those settings. Obviously, they're mandatory on public transport, on the tube, uh, but they have a great deal of value in 
uh, confined spaces where you're meeting, you're coming into contact with people uh, you don't normally meet. And what's been interesting on the, the face coverings issue in the last few months is that the scientific sort of evaluation of uh, face coverings and, and, and their importance in stopping uh, aerosol uh, droplets, uh, that's been growing. Last week, masks were made mandatory in Scotland. And we will, of course, continue to follow that story and bring you more details as we get them. Prime Minister Johnson will launch a campaign to urge businesses to prepare for the end of the Brexit transition period, December 31st. A survey shows only a quarter of directors say their firms are ready. Meantime, British authorities say they'll spend $890 million on new border infrastructure. Hong Kong's taking new steps to keep the coronavirus from spreading. It's shutting all gyms and game arcades for the next seven days. Public gatherings will be limited to no more than four people, and all inbound travelers will have to pass a virus test. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Well, the presidential election this year is happening in the middle of three crises, not one, not two, but three, with a pandemic, an economic collapse, and, of course, the racial strife that we're seeing across the country. Uh, we are now welcome an expert in presidential leadership and history. She is Dr. Lara Brown. She's an associate professor of political science at George Washington University. She's also director of its graduate school of political management, and not least, not least, she's the author of the forthcoming book coming out later this month, Amateur Hour, Presidential Character and the Quality of Leadership. So, Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Let me start with the hard one. President Trump has quite an uphill climb as of right now. We've still got three and a half months to go. But has anybody ever had to hold on to the presidency with this kind of crisis around them? Well, I do think that when we look at this moment, it's really most analogous to Jimmy Carter's run in 1980, right? He was a first-term party president who was running for re-election. And he was deep in sort of trouble with his own party. He um, had a challenge from Senator Ted Kennedy in the primaries, which he managed to win. But then, obviously, the hostage situation with Iran and the poor economy caught up with him, and his leadership was thought lacking, and there was a desire for a change to Ronald Reagan. Yeah, there was the humiliation of the hostage crisis, as well as runaway inflation at the time. As you look at Donald Trump, the current president of the United States, uh, how much of this election do you think will be determined by how people perceive his response to the pandemic is? Well, I think it's going to be important. I also think that part of what we're looking at is really an a more general referendum on Donald Trump's presidency. We saw this in 2018, and we are now seeing this again, that there is a sense that this president, for whatever he says, does not appear to demonstrate leadership in the moments that they are needed. He tends to sow division, and he tends to focus on those things that are personally impacting him rather than impacting the country. And yet, Professor, he was elected president in 2016, and I'm not sure that there are any aspects of his character we're seeing now that we didn't know in 2016. So what does that say about what the country wanted, why they were willing to put him in office, if he exhibits the sort of character you describe? Because the people voted him in. Well, they did, but they voted him in in a very different circumstance. I think one of the things that election analysts um, neglect is how very different elections are when they are considered open seat elections versus incumbent referendum. Um, what we had in 2016 was a question to the American people of who do you like better, um, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, and who do you think best should succeed Barack Obama, and the country said, we're not crazy about the direction that the Democrats have been going in for the last eight years. We think we want to change. We're not necessarily enthusiastic about Hillary Clinton as a nominee. And so they said, 
you know, well, she may win anyway, but I might as well try to vote for change and for Donald Trump, who was an unknown. This time around, it's a very different kind of perspective. The only question really voters need to ask themselves is, does Donald Trump deserve four more years or not? And if they conclude that he doesn't, then the choice for Joe Biden comes in. Uh, Professor, give us a little preview of the book coming out later this month. Uh, stack up, align the characters of Donald J. Trump and Joseph Biden uh, against one another. And what do they tell us about the sorts of leaders they either are or would be? Well, this book really argues that since uh, Jimmy Carter's election in 1976, the country has more often than not been infatuated with the idea of having an outsider, someone from outside Washington, meaning most of the time that meant a governor. Um, but obviously with Donald Trump, it meant outside politics altogether, and that they have been more and more interested in people with kind of wide name recognition or celebrities, if you will. Because if you look back to 2008, Barack Obama um, did become a national celebrity during his race in not dissimilar ways to how Donald Trump did in 2016. And so I think what we're looking at as we go forward is this question, are we prepared to elect somebody with political experience and who may be a Washington insider? Or is there still a desire for somebody who's going to, in the president's word, drain the swamp? And while it is more difficult for Trump to make that argument because he is the current president and he has been in Washington now for more than three years, there is still this idea that he is an outsider in and of himself. So this is really interesting, Professor, because if that analysis is right, I have no reason to believe it's not right, then then in order for Joe Biden to win the presidency this year, you'd need a different kind of change election, not just changing who's in the office, but changing what we're looking for. Because you're saying go, going back all the way to Jimmy Carter, people would say, let's have an outsider. And Joe Biden is the opposite of an outsider. He is. He very much is. And this is where I would say this looks in some ways the way Californians perceive their gubernatorial election after Arnold Schwarzenegger's tenure in office. They were looking for somebody with experience, not star power. That person was Jerry Brown, the former governor and longtime political insider. We also saw a similar dynamic with Minnesotans choosing Tim Pawlenty on the heels of Jesse Ventura in the uh, gubernatorial races. So this is not unusual that the country says what we chose last time didn't work for us this time. What is interesting is that were Joe Biden to be elected, he would be the first real kind of longtime party insider from Washington elected since George H.W. Bush in 1988. Okay. Thank you so much for, for joining us, Professor. That is Professor Laura Brown of George Washington University and the author, once again, of the forthcoming book, 